All right, hello, hello to all. We're in for something a little different today, something a little special some, that we've been planning in the works for a while, but we've taken our time to assemble some tools. So today we're going to be going over the tier 8 carriers in the game, all nine of them, including the Enterprise, which I don't currently own, but I will very briefly uh, skim over it just to be thorough in my analysis as we go over the tier 8 carriers today and talk about the various carrier lines, their respective premiums that are available with each carrier line, and why you should or shouldn't play a given carrier. Uh, now I'm going to flip away from all the warships for just a moment, and hopefully we should bring up our Google Chrome. Okay, it's not perceiving. Very nice. Okay, sorry about the brief black screen. But before we move up to there, let's go over our preamble. So this is the general write-up of why we're doing tier 8 carriers today, but the general point is that for me, excuse me, uh, I believe that tier 8 carriers in World of Warships in their current iteration represent the best general characteristics of a given carrier line. So at tier 8, Carriers are first getting access to that heal that's present on torpedo bombers, and in the case of German uh, tech tree carriers, uh, the torpedo bombers and dive bombers. As well, the type bombers and torpedo bombers and rockets and such will go from their twin loadouts to the triple loadouts that you tend to see on tier 8s and that you tend to retain on tier 10s uh, with particular exceptions, such as the Japanese carriers, which keep twin torpedo setups that are extremely powerful or the Implacable, which doesn't get access to its triple level bomber uh, loadout until it reaches tier 10. But for the most part, that munitions density that you get at tier 8 is representative of what you'll be having for the rest of the line. Uh, in addition, tier 8 carriers represent that nice power spike where when they're top tier against tier 6 ships, they're extremely powerful. On tier, they're still, well, they're aircraft carriers, so they have a huge amount of mash influence, and even bottom tier, uh, you can still carry a, carry a game if you know what you're doing and you target the right uh, enemy surface ships. Uh, and so because of these characters that are present on tier 8 carriers, generally speaking, uh, how a player kind of feels about a tier 8 carrier in a given carrier line, and how they perform in a tier 8 carrier in a carrier line should uh, act as a general rough representation of how they will function in a tier 10 carrier on that carrier line. So that tier 8 is a nice litmus test, you could say, for their overall general future performance when they reach that tier 10. And we're going to scroll up from the tier list. I guess I should have scrolled up earlier, so... But whatever, you get a sneak peek. And then up here we have a table that we're going to be working with throughout this uh, overview to kind of fill out. So we're going to be doing ratings from A to S, or sorry, from S to D. So if you're not familiar from, with the S to D rating system, so we go from S, A, B, kind of, oh, sorry little bit rough typing, D, and normally there would be an F, but we're not going to go with an F, we're just going to keep it simple, so there's going to be five ratings. You can kind of think of these as um, scaling from S being the best to D being the worst in terms of rating, but we're going to use the letter system because I think tier lists tend to use letters for whatever odd reason, so we're going to stay nice and consistent. So with that said, we're going to be filling out this table as we go through the carriers, and we're going to be going through in the order of nationality. So we're going to start with the Japanese carrier pair as I pull OBS back up and bring down that back into the client. So I'm going to be on my main for this. So there's on my main, I own most of the carriers except the Enterprise, as I iterated. So first up, the Shokaku. So the first thing we're going to go over is hull characteristics. So general hull characteristics of the Japanese tech tree carrier. Japanese carriers are extremely stealthy in general. The Hakaru is a bit of an exception. Actually, most tier tech carriers are quite unstealthy, but the tier 8 Shokaku is quite stealthy with her full standard build, staying at 10.8 kilometer detection. So this gives her fairly good detectability. In addition, 
even though she is unarmored, so no special armor plates, just 19 and the belt. She does have a fairly good hit point pool at 54,000 and 25% bulge protection, so this is a pretty good fleet carrier bulge protection. 34 knots gives her good speed. Turning circle is pretty average for carriers, so we don't really worry about that. And the last defensive feature is her AA, and as you can see with 225 continuous at tier 8, and only a couple of flak buffs. Only 5 that is spawned at 5.8. Nothing particularly special in AA, so moderate AA and moderate survivability, so a lightly armored hull that's quite fast with good concealment. So overall, we are going to give the Shokaku a B rating for hull. It's kind of borderline onto A just because of the speed, but the thin armor keeps us at a B. And I'm going to fill out the document, but we're going to go look back at the table after I filled everything out so I don't have to keep flipping off of the uh, World of Warships client. Okay, I'm not sure if that actually was showing. So if it wasn't showing, sorry about that. But we were just going over the armor, so as I said, 54,000 and 25% bulge, 34 knots of speed, and 10 kilometer concealment, or 10.8 kilometers concealment is going to give us an overall B. So that's all for the actual hull characteristics. So our next parameter is going to be tiering sensitivity. So how sensitive is the Shokaku to being up-tiered or down-tiered? Well, the answer is she's not particularly sensitive. The Shokaku actually has an excellent loadout of aircraft. Now, as a Japanese carrier, she goes for a kind of moderate to fast regen capability, fairly low durability planes, and fairly fast uh, moving planes. So as you can see, her rocket plane is only 1600 hit points or so, but they can reach a maximum speed of 191 knots. Ryu says 2000 HP, not that great again, but 177 knots, pretty good speed, and 185 on the dive bombers with 18,050 health, again a moderate amount, but the regen times are fairly short. You can see 69 on the dive bombers, 65 on the torpedo bombers, and 60 seconds on the rocket planes. Her hangar size, which kind of bleeds into the endurance statistic, but that's fine, we're talking about endurance still. And tiering sensitivity, sorry, we're talking about tiering sensitivity still. Her hangar size is large, so when she's top tier, her planes are pretty much um, more than sufficient to get through a match. And when she's even when she's bottom tier, if you pre-drop, she has more than enough punching power to get through. Now, in terms of tiering sensitivity, she does have HE rockets, which are relatively tier agnostic. Do note they have 28 millimeters of penetration, so they're going to be much, much stronger when you're top tier, but even when you're bottom tier, you can still target most cruisers. Pretty much all destroyers outside of some select special ones like the Kabarosk. And you can of course target superstructure. In addition, the main armament of the Shokaku is the torpedo bombers, and torpedo bombers are target agnostic munitions. They do not care if you're a destroyer, carrier, cruiser, or battleship. Now versus battleships there will be some amount of bulk protection typically that will reduce the damage, but overall torpedoes are a target agnostic type of munition. You can use them to hit any type of target if you have enough skill. And so as a result, when you lean on target agnostic torpedoes as your main form of damage, you get less sensitive to tiering, which increases your rating in that tiering sensitivity rating. AP bombers, on the other hand, are extremely tiering sensitive. Uh, depending on tier, if you have AP bombers, you will need to have a good sense of what targets you're going to overpenetrate, as in they have too little armor for you to arm your bombs, so citadels are inconsistent inconsistent, what targets you can penetrate, so what targets you will consistently get citadels on and can get a good amount of impact on, and what targets you cannot penetrate, oh, typically battleships or very heavily armored cruisers, where their deck armor is too heavy for you to penetrate. So overall the best munition on the Shokaku is the torpedo bombers. They hit for a staggering 7200, and they do 55 knots of speed. Uh, in addition, the torpedo bombers themselves are extremely stealthy, reaching a maximum stealth rating with the full build of 6.7 kilometers. This of course allows you to approach targets from some quite sneaky angles and thus increases the efficacy of that target agnostic torpedo bomber. The speed of the bombers also allows them to close through a pretty heavy flak if necessary, and that heal, be, while being since that heal is present, the torpedoes can punch through. Overall, because of these general characteristics, the Shokaku 
gets an A rating in terms of tearing sensitivity. Uh, she will suffer a little bit when she is bottom tier in a tier 10 game, but overall she can still manage, and when she's top tier she's obviously a monster, and when she's on tier she's still a monster. The next parameter we're going to be using is endurance, so that's how much <clears throat> losses can the carrier sustain over a match, and how does a longer match affect the capability of the carrier to perform. Now the Shokaku has fairly large reserves with the standard build, 16, 17, and 16 if I'm not mistaken, yep. So 16, 17, 16, so fairly large starting reserves and fairly short regeneration times of full build of 60, 65, and 69 as I mentioned earlier. The combination of generally good reserves as well as a rather relatively short regeneration time means that the Shokaku has excellent endurance. Now. Uh, it's not going to be top in class, that which would make it an S rating, but it has good enough regeneration to basically have planes throughout the entirety of a match, even in tier 10. Now, if you have to make some more expensive attacks, you are going to find yourself getting deplaned fairly quickly, but overall, the Shokaku has no trouble maintaining her reserves over the course of the match, which earns her an A rating. Our next parameter that we're going to go over is flexibility. So, how capable is the carrier of going after any given target can it attack destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and carriers with the same efficacy. And of course, if you've been listening, uh, you will have received the general impression that the Shokaku is relatively flexible. She has an HE rocket, which is more effective against more targets than AP rockets. Since it's angle agnostic, it doesn't have to particularly care about angling. Now, it will obviously affect it with that reticle that's elliptical in nature, but it's not going to prevent it from dealing damage to pretty much all targets. The only targets that resist those rockets, as I mentioned, are more heavily armored cruisers and battleship plating. The torpedoes are the main armament, and of course they are class agnostic, as I mentioned. Battleships will have torpedo ball trading, and destroyers will have a certain amount of torpedo damage saturation, but overall the only munition that's kind of sensitive to the target type is the AP dive bombers. You can't really use the AP dive bombers against destroyers, obviously, and most carriers will be somewhat resistant. Uh, there's very few tier 8 carrier opponents that are sensitive to citadels. Generally, just the Shokaku itself and the Kaga are more vulnerable. The Lexington is kind of a bit too tall to take AP bombers, and then the Implacable and Indomitable have armored decks, and then the Graf Zeppelin and Augustus von Parsifal have turtle backs, which make citadels against them inconsistent. Generally speaking, however, since the torpedo bombers and rockets are both quite good, the Shokaku manages to get a A rating for flexibility. Now our last parameter is carry power. How capable is this carrier of carrying a game? So when you're down and behind and you need to secure some key kills no matter what, in order to swing a game that you're losing, or if you're just looking to break, break an even game and bring it into an advantage, how capable is the carrier of breaking open a game? Now most carriers are going to be capable of breaking open a game in one way or another, but we're going to be comparing them to only each other, so we're going by relative power here, so keep that in mind. Just like how a cruiser with less utility, so cruisers without radar and without hydro, uh, end up being just DPM monsters with a little less carry power outside of just burning their way to victory, or a battleship can feel a bit helpless in terms of being able to carry a game, other than if they're capable of just brute forcing their way into a cap with a combination of armor and secondaries, or raw healing, or just being unkillable, or just killing people from across the map. Those are those ships' forms of carry power, and destroyers, of course, their carry power is in their ability to contest caps and take objective points and duel other destroyers for the objective points, and after that to attack other targets across the map with their torpedoes or guns. The carrier's carry power kind of generally looks at how capable are its three squadrons of destroying enemy surface ships and thereby carrying a game that way. The carrier is not that capable of carrying a game through the objective-based gameplay of seizing a cap, but you can ha attain carry power by threatening destroyers and keeping them out of the caps so that your destroyer, your own destroyers can get into the caps. So this is a bit of a more vague parameter, but if you were paying attention, again as I said, pretty flexible rockets, very flexible torpedoes that hit very hard, and 
bombers that are more specialized but can deal very large sums of damage with increased precision, I will note. The Japanese AP dive bomber compared to its German AP dive bomber counterparts is a fair bit more accurate. You should notice uh, a fair bit more consistency with its dive bombs. So with these three factors in mind, we're going to give an A rating to the Shokaku. Now the reason it doesn't get an S rating in terms of carry power is because, well, its planes are a bit fragile, so versus extremely heavy A, it can have some trouble forcing through uh, its planes onto targets, especially the dive bombers. Since they lack the heal of the Augustus von Parsifal, even though they're slightly tankier, they're also quite a bit slower than the Parsifal's dive bombers and lacking that heal. If you need to force through onto a target, even those nine dive bombers might not be enough to punch through onto, say, a tier 10 cruiser with heavy AA. Uh, the torpedo bombers fare a little bit better with that heal consumable. But the rockets, on the other hand, might not have enough pen to kill a given target. They don't have the greatest fire chance to guarantee a fire if you need it. Need it. And they are relatively fragile, so overall the only t squadron that can force through onto a target if necessary and truly carry a game is the torpedo bombers. So not quite reaching that S rating where you can really take an entire full squadron, not think, not care too much about the consequences, and make sure a target will die and carry a game that way. The general eff efficacy of the rocket planes and torpedo planes, however, will allow me to give it an A rating. So, overall, if we look at our document, we see the Shokaku gets a B in hull performance characteristics and then an A in the other four. So B, A, A, A. So generally speaking, you can see the Shokaku is quite a powerful package overall. Now we'll move on to its premium counterpart, the Kaga. Sorry if this black screen is a bit disconcerting to you, but if you can think of a more comfortable way to view this interfacing, you are free to do so and let me know in the comments. So the Kaga is the premium counterpart to the Shokaku, as you can see, I have a quite extensive experience in the Kaga based on the experience. Anyhow, we'll keep going right along with the same general formula and start with the Kaga's overall hull characteristics. So durability wise, you can see Kaga, no special armor plates, but also an extremely large target very, very high in the water, so it's just as thinly armored as the Shokaku, and high in the water, which makes it quite vulnerable. In addition, the Kaga's Citadel is a little bit higher. You can note that it's covered in some armor plates, thanks to its former role as a battleship prior to conversion, but you can see the Citadel behind it is quite raised above the water, even underneath that uh, slight turtle very large citadel space. 57,000 hit points on the other hand is quite respectable, 3,000 more than its Shokaku Tech 3 counterpart, and 22% bullet protection which is, which gives them roughly equivalent protection against torpedoes. AA defense wise, you can see the Kaga has a pitiful 153 continuous and puts up 5 flak puffs again at 518, so even worse than the Shokaku which was already pretty middling, so AA is pretty piss poor. Now do note that the Kaga has a fearsome looking set of secondaries, but they're all located towards the rear of the ship, so the gun angles are pretty bad. And they have a pitiful, I think it's 4.5 kilometer range? No, it's 5 kilometer range, right? No, it's 4.5. So they have terrible range, so don't rely on them for defense. Maneuverability wise, Kaga is a former battleship, so it has a absolutely monstrous 14, 14 second rudder shift. Again, over a kilometer of Turn to radius and a maximum speed this time of 28 knots, which makes it one of the slowest carriers of at the tier. So pretty low speed, large squishy target so far. And last but not least, the concealment rating is 9.9, .9, which is excellent. So hull characteristics overall, uh, pretty average survivability, bad AA, bad maneuverability, and excellent concealment. So overall, we're going to give it a B to B minus. The speed is actually quite a factor. So, depending on what you want, it's B to C, but given given how frequently the hull characteristics come into play, that's not frequently that important, we're just going to give it a B. So, it's similar to the Shokaku, you have emphasis in concealment over hull speed, so you can reposition a little less well, and you're a bit more of a target, 
but because of that superior concealment, you can get a little bit closer if you can find an appropriate island, that kind of thing. So overall, we're going to rate them about the same. Now, moving on to tiering sensitivity. How sensitive is the Kaga to being up-tiered or down-tiered? Well, I can tell you right now, the Kaga is an absolute monster when it's top-tier. It has literally almost infinite planes. You start the match with 96 planes on deck, just for reference. So, in order to throw away 96 planes in a game where you're a top-tier tier 8 carrier, in a game where you're attacking tier 6s, you'd have to be doing something phenomenally stupid, so... Versus top tier, it's not so bad. Likewise, even though you have tier 7 aircraft, so if you get to these zeros or the tensions, for example, you will note that this is a tier 7 aircraft, so it receives only 7, uh, seven ticks of HP from skills say, like survivability expert and that kind of thing. So tier 7 aircraft make it a little more sensitive to receiving less buffs and less being squishier overall in terms of receiving AA. And the planes are also kind of slow. 189 knots on zeros, 177 on the Tenzins, and 187 on the Suseis. So similar speed to the Shokaku's aircraft, but you will note that they have a little less HP, just about 100 to 150 less HP each, and the regeneration times are kind of a little bit longer. You can see 67 on the dive bombers, but 86 on the Tenzins, and 94 seconds on the zeros. However, even so, with that said, when you're bottom tier, you lose a lot of aircraft in the Kaga. That's just the nature of things. Shokaku already loses a lot of aircraft, and likewise, the Kaga also will lose a lot of aircraft where planes are even squishier. However, that massive hangar size gives the Kaga a fair bit of resistance to being bottom tier. You can, it's not that your planes survive when they attack targets, but rather you have so many of them that you can afford to throw them at a target. Uh, for a couple of times and be a bit silly if you really need to. And thus, even when you're bottom tier, in spite of having those tier 7 aircraft, the massive squadrons of the Kaga make it so that she's still more than capable of attacking most targets. So, in spite of having these worse planes than the Shokaku, she's still going to earn an A rating for tiering sensitivity. She's generally not that sensitive to being bottom tier because of her large squad squadron sizes and large hangar capacity. So again, she's going to earn an A quite similar to her tech tree counterpart. Moving on to endurance. As you might have guessed from what I said about the planes during the tiering sensitivity part, the endurance of the Kaga is immense. Top tier, you're basically never going to be able to run out of planes. It's, I, I really can't see a situation where that's possible unless you literally fly beside an enemy Lexington and just sit in his flak auras for the whole match. You're pretty much never going to run out of planes unless you absolutely screw something up. Excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. But as I was saying, your large reserves pretty much guarantee you to have more than enough planes for the duration of a match. Even when you're bottom tier in a tier 10 game, because of that large reserve size and relatively okay regeneration speed, the Kaga is going to have more than enough planes to attack most targets at least a couple of times and you'll be able to do your job in general. So as for endurance, uh, you could even say she has better endurance than the Shokaku. It's kind of like, because she's so effective when she's top tier, and because she's also still effective to a certain extent, even when she's bottom tier, she's going to earn an S rating just because of that 96 plane reserve. Uh, even if you make a major mistake, and say a flak puff destroys an entire torpedo bomber squadron that you didn't pre-drop, so you lose 12 planes randomly, right? You still have 24 more on deck. So... The same applies to your dive bombers, and your attack planes are terrible, but you have 24 of them anyway, so if you really wanted to use them, you still got another 16 after spending a whole squadron on something. Let's say you spend 8 rocket planes to attack a Worcester and attack its superstructure for 5,000 damage. You can do that if you really want to. It's really not a problem. So, in terms of endurance, the Kaga is going to earn herself an S rating. 
the next parameter is of course going to be flexibility. And so this talks about how flexible are the squadrons. Now, the Kaga, unlike her texture counterpart Shokaku, is an HE dive bomber carrier. So she's kind of more similar to the American carriers. She has HE rockets with kind of lowish penetration, but serviceable penetration does a low amount of them. They're kind of limited. They're effective versus destroyers to a limited extent, and they are moderately useful for setting fires and doing chip damage versus larger targets. The torpedo bombers are less target agnostic compared to the Shokakus. So you can see they have that 19,000 hit points, but each torpedo that they carry only hits for 5,400. In exchange, it's a 3x4 squadron, so you attack with four planes at once. The speed is exactly the same at 53 knots. And the concealment on the torpedo bombers, because the Kaga is able to take that concealment expert and concealment module, is actually even better. However, the Kaga four plane torpedo bomber setup is very picky. The spacing between the torpedoes is extremely wide and the arming distance is very long and as a result they are less effective against smaller targets compared to the Shokaku's twin torpedoes which are more precise and focused and can deliver a lot of punching power on just those two torpedoes at, one, at a time directly onto a target, whereas the Kaga spreads its damage over those four torpedoes, so even though the overall alpha of, uh, what is it, 22,000 theoretical over the four torpedoes is higher than the theoretical alpha of the Shokaku's 14,500, the Shokaku can deliver that 14,000 damage much more precisely and guarantee you put that damage directly onto the target, whereas these torpedo bombers struggle. Uh, just to illustrate, if I pull up our first illustrative video here. Flip over to this clip of me in the Kaga here. This was played Alpha recently. First strike. So I'm going to mute myself and talk over. So you can see me arming those four torpedo bombers, swinging them in. Japanese torpedo bombers are fairly sensitive, so you can see that the reticle does not narrow very well. And you can see that large arming distance. So I don't know if you could see that there, but if we rewind, and look at the amount of arming distance. So look at this space here as we come into the attack. So I don't know if you can see directly, but if you compare the length of this Ohio that I'm attacking and the necessary arming distance that needs to be between, that needs to, it needs to like exist in terms of space between you and the target, it's actually longer than the Ohio. So you need to leave more than the length of an Ohio between you and a target. So if the target is beside an island, you won't be able to attack the target very well with the torpedo bombers. In addition, as the torpedoes drop into the water, you can see them combing the target fairly widely spaced, which makes them less versatile against hitting a destroyer. You can see I didn't get the full narrowing on the cone, but you're not always going to get be able to get that full narrowing on the cone. So as a result, the overall sp spread of the torpedoes was actually wider than the length of the Ohio. So as a result, I actually ended up missing that bow torpedo and I only hit him with three torpedoes there. As well, you can see the uh, relatively low hit points of the planes, getting them a bit shredded, but because I have that large squadron, I'm able to kind of ignore that tiering difference and come around for another attack, even without using my heel. This is, of course, with no interfering AA on the way coming in. And again, you can see that long arming distance and the wide net. So that's what I wanted to say about the Kaga. Now we still have one more squadron to talk about, so we'll flip back into client and talk about the dive bombers before we go. Now the dive bombers, they have an HE bomb. And in terms of their characteristics, Pretty low HP, but high speed, and fairly short regeneration time. So this is actually the shortest regenerating time, regeneration time plane on the Kaga overall. With 36 of them, you can kind of throw them at the targets, and they have a 8,800 HE alpha bomb with 55 millimeters of penetration. So the bomb penetrates most targets in the game. Um, when you're top tier and on tier, you'll penetrate basically every ship in the game in terms of its plating. If you hit turret armor and or belt armor and that kind of thing, they are going to shatter some amount of bombs, but generally it pens most targets. When you're bottom tier and you start seeing ships like the Sovetsky Soyuz and the Kremlin, 
which have 60 millimeter plates, they will be a bit limited. But for the most part, the dive bombers have enough HE pen to pen basically any target, and with 50% fire chance, they are relatively consistent. Now they are also in a 3x4 setup, so they are only dropping 4 bombs per pass with a fairly large reticle. If I flip back out to the Kaga clip that I closed and flip to a section where we get onto a destroyer. So if you can see here, I have this gearing on screen, a tier 10 destroyer, a fairly large tier 10 destroyer. And you can see the dive bombers descending. Again, they have that those HE dive bombs characteristics, so you can kind of twist and turn inside the reticle with ease. I know the pixelation is not great. Let me see if I can reload into 1080. But you can see the reticle is about the size of a destroyer, but again, they keep that Japanese accuracy, so they are relatively accurate. So if I can flip back and show you the dive again. So the reticle is the standard HE dive bomber ellipse size. There's no nothing special about the HE ellipse size, but you're dropping only four bombs into the area with a bit of a wonky animation. So if you see here, the arming time arms fairly quickly, and then you descend onto the target, and you can descend quite low before delivering the bombs onto the target, in this case attacking a destroyer fairly effectively. But if we put an example on of dive bombers onto a larger target, for example, such as the Ohio, I believe I used dive bombers at this point. So you can see me here attacking an Ohio, kind of similar, small reticle, roughly a third of the ship length. And in this case, I sling the four bombs, but only land two bombs, and one bomb hits a turret. So the dive bombers are relatively consistent. HE bomb them because they're HE munitions, they tend to be pretty target agnostic. But overall, the torpedoes are more limited in terms of flexibility. And the rockets are kind of terrible. So as a result, the flexibility rating will end up getting a B rating there. Now in terms of carry power, moving back into the client. Okay, I forgot to hide this, but that's fine. I think. <laughs> Hopefully you were able to see that. Okay, I think I flipped it, sorry. So moving back into the client. Our last parameter is of course carry power. How capable is the Kaga of carrying a game? So her hull's pretty good. It's, well, actually, it's kind of mediocre, but her planes are quite excellent. You kind of have unlimited planes, which allows you to do some creative things with the Kaga. You can overwhelm targets with very, very large sums of planes and attack with the same type of squadron over and over. This obviously allows you to harass a single target quite a bit, and if it's a heavier target, such as a large cruiser or a battleship, especially slower battleships like Tier 7s or 8s, American Standards, that kind of thing, Colorado, New Mexico, that can't really get away. You can very easily overwhelm them with attack planes that they can't really run from. And, as I saw, demonstrated earlier in that little video clip where I was attacking the Ohio, even versus Tier 10, service ships you can perform quite well. Uh, you can attack them with the large squadron size without too much fear. That was toward the end of the match there. You you could see I'd already used several of my planes, but I was still able to field full squadrons and really attack whatever target I really needed to. And the HE dive bombs being present allow me to harass destroyers when necessary. Now, the dive bombers aren't particularly excellent, no, nor are the rockets, but they can get the job done. And as a result, the Kaga can generally carry a game in most circumstances uh, where she doesn't really excel is that Yukaga does her damage a little more slowly than the Shokaku overall. Uh, because she delivers less damage per munition, her HE bombs only hit for 3000 per bomb compared to the Shokaku's 6200 maximum alpha on her AP bombs, and each torpedo only hits for 5400 compared to the 7200 of the Shokaku. So if you fail to deliver all four torpedoes at once, you are going to kill targets a little bit slower. And the rockets are Frankly, as I said, kind of terrible. They only really deal chip damage, maximum alpha damage onto a destroyer is 2200 times 8 divided by 3. 
So 2200 by 8 is 16,000 or so. 17,600 technically, and then you divide by 3. Roughly 6,000-ish alpha on a destroyer, not particularly fantastic. These Shokaku rockets, on the other hand, have a maximum alpha that's almost double that. Double that, actually. I think it might be more. It's like 13,000, 14,000. So overall, a little less flexible than the Shokaku, but the carry power is still roughly the same. It's just distributed differently. The Shokaku is more able to deal with destroyers and light cruisers, whereas the Kaga is more specialized for dealing with big, heavy, lumbering targets like the battleships. Although her access to HE dive bombers does give her some niche situations where if you're in a bit of a pinch, you don't have time to use torpedo bombers to hit destroyers, since a maneuvering destroyer can be quite tricky to hit with torpedoes. She can be a fair bit more useful there. So overall, because of that, I would give her an equal rating to the Shokaku in that aspect. And so if we pull up our table, we're going to give her a final carry power rating of A. Large reserves with relatively specialized squadrons, but because she has so many planes of each type, she can use the applicable plane for, for the applicable target, and as a result, kind of equal out the Shokaku. So if we can see here, we have kind of similar rating on the hulls. The Kaga is also similarly tiering agnostic. It's actually a little less agnostic, so this is kind of more like a B minus, and this is kind of more like an A plus if you compare it to it's here. The Shokaku. I'm gonna use pluses and minuses, I guess, just to kind of help distinguish ships. She's a little less flexible, but overall, in terms of carry power, she's about the same. So you can see the Shokaku and Kaga are actually matched up fairly well in terms of tech tree to premium ship with uh, specializations in different areas. Slightly worse hull, but in exchange, you get less sensitivity to tiering and better endurance. Uh, but you have to use the right squadron for the right target more often rather than just using torpedoes for everything, like the Shokaku. And yeah, by the way, if you hadn't figured it out, this is going to be a bit of a long video. <laughs> we still have a couple of carriers to go through. So next we have the Lexington moving on to the Americans. So if we flip back onto our client, this is the USS Lexington. So here we go, fairly large ship, very similar to the Kaga, a conversion in this case from the Lexington class battle cruisers. Now Lexington is one of the best tech tree carriers, but that's not saying much since there's only four of them. But overall an excellent ship as you will see. Armor layout wise, no special plates, pretty lightly armored, 25mm deck however, which does resist some amount of destroyer shells, 19mm sides, Pretty standard belt, massive, massive size, which means she's an easy target for battleships at range. And a citadel that's raised above the water and not particularly thickly armored, as you can see. So overall, not really anything special for armor. Now for HP, she has a colossal 60,000, so even more than the Kaga, but only a 16% bulge. So a little more durable against regular shell fire compared to the two Japanese counterparts, but a little less durable against random torpedoes from destroyers, such as, such as say an Asashio torpedo which cleans up into the back of the map, or against enemy carrier torpedoes. AA-wise, the Lexington has a continuous damage of 555, focused mostly in the mid-range aura, which does 627. So. As you can see, she has more than double of the Shokaku, and she has something like four Kagas worth of AA on board. Six flag puffs compared to the five of the Japanese, also at 5.8, but overall excellent carrier AA, best in tier pretty much. Maneuverability wise, Lexington is a colossal whale with 15.6 second rudder shift time, but she does still do 33 knots of speed, courtesy of her battle cruiser heritage. Turning circle is again massive. And last but not least, you can see with full build, a 14.5 kilometer detection. Now do note that I don't have a 19 point captain and this captain does not have concealment experts. So you can bring this down by 10%, but even so with the captain spec in, we're not gonna be going over captain builds by the way, and just it's a little too much for one video. 
So bringing it down by a 1.45, so let's say about 1.5, you can bring her concealment down to 13, which is still vastly inferior to her counterparts of the Japanese carriers. So very, very good AA, pretty good, very good HP pool, decent speed, and but a colossal detectability rating. Overall, we're going to give the Lexington, as a result, a, a in hull performance. Her size and massive detectability isn't really an issue as long as you keep your carrier hull moving. And her excellent AA means that if she does get harassed by aircraft, she can shoot them down with fair, fairly good ease. And even though she is a colossal whale, once she gets moving, she does do 33 knots of speed, so she can actually outrun most of the battleships in the game. And so as a result, she gets an A rating for hull characteristics. Now next, tiering sensitivity. How sensitive is the Lexington to being up-tiered or down-tiered? Well, let's take a look. Her aircraft are fairly tanky. You can see these 1660 HP Corsairs which do 214 knots. In addition, more importantly, those Corsairs that are extremely fast have 33 millimeters of penetration. So what this means is that whether your battleships on the enemy team are tier 8s or upward, or tier 8s and lower, 33 is always enough to beat the 32 millimeter plate on battleships that are high tier. So no matter what, there will be some area of a battleship that the rockets can damage outside of the superstructure, which obviously all rockets can damage. So the rockets are extremely flexible regardless of tier. Torpedo-wise, the Lexington has an excellent torpedo as well. It's a 3x3 three three setup on a fairly slow plane, only 164 knots, but in exchange that plane has 2080 HP. Now the torpedoes are only 42 knots with torpedo acceleration. However, that 18,000 alpha does end up being more, a little bit more than the uh, Shokaku's torpedo alpha overall. Now she doesn't, she's not able to make as many attacks because the Shokaku has a 2x5 squadron compared to the Lexington's 3x3. Usually, the Lexington can make at most two attacks, so that total alpha is about 36,000 compared to the Shokaku, which can make up to three attacks, so three by three. 3 by 15,000 is roughly closer to 45,000 alpha, so you can see the difference there, but still a fairly good torpedo. If we flip over to some video footage that we have prepared with the Lexington. So on screen we have her dive bombs. Absolute monster. Two bombs strike onto the buyer. I'm gonna mute myself. And we're still talking about torpedoes, so just flipping over to a torpedo section. Sorry about the load. Would wish it would load a little bit faster. So this is the torpedo bomber squadron. So unlike the Japanese torpedoes, which are usually twinned, or in the case of the Kaga as quads, these are a triple setup. You can see me here attacking a destroyer of some sort. I can't quite read the name right now, but you can see your reticle is fairly tight as long as you can hold them steady. You can see me turning a little here and adjusting. Oh, it's actually a mains. And if we watch, you can see the spread is not nearly as wide as the Shokaku's. In addition, we're dropping quite a bit closer to the target because that arming distance is not as long as either the Shokaku's or the Kaga's. And so as a result, even though the torpedoes are a bit slower, which makes them less flexible at 42 knots of speed, still fairly easy, capable of dealing quite a bit of damage. And you can see the three torpedoes hitting for that 18,000 alpha, more than capable of finishing off a target. Now while we're here, might as well look for some dive bomb passes. This looks to be a dive bomb pass here. Sorry about the load time. All right, that's the end of an attack. So let's actually go to the beginning of the attack on this battery. Come on, YouTube. So we have five planes here. We're diving through a fighter, as you can see on screen or on the minimap. So these planes are fairly slow, but they are quite durable. You can see with five 
somewhat damage planes remaining in the squad, and we still have 8,000 hit points. It's a 3x3 three three setup that moves fairly slowly, but is quite maneuverable. So you can see I'm not on axis, but I'm going to turn on to the actual axis, roughly speaking, catch a fighter, still manage to arm two bombs, and two bombs impact the Bayern there for 2,000, so not a perfect hit. but showing off the general bombing characteristics. If we flip forward a little more, we can see another dive bomb attack here, and this time again on the Bayern, three bombers. Nice and easy. You can see that reticle is actually a little bit larger than the Kaga's, if you rewind a little bit, about the size of the Bayern itself. But they don't climb quite as high before they dive. And dropping the six bombs there gives a good density. Five bombs impacting a fairly saturated Bayern for 10,900 and setting a fire with ease. These bombers are the core of the Lexington's kit, kind of like your best squadron. Sorry, I forgot to flip out on the client. So if you look at their actual characteristics here in the client, you can see they deal 9,200 damage and they have 53 millimeters of penetration. 53 is enough to, as just like the rockets, deal with most targets at the tier. Uh, if we remember the Kaga bombers with the 55mm penetration, 53 is effectively the same. As long as you beat 50, you can attack basically every target, except targets that have 60mm of penetration. And with 57% fire chance and an even higher alpha, and dropping 6 bombs at once, you can imagine the dive bombers are extremely flexible. As a result, the Lexington is capable of attacking basically any and all targets. The bombs are devastating against destroyers, and they still do large sums of damage to battleships and cruisers when they impact. The, the torpedoes are slow, so not as effective against the destroyer-type targets, but very good against cruisers and battleships, and still usable against destroyers in a pinch if you can aim a little bit better with those 40 new knot torpedoes. And the rockets, of course, do a massive amount of damage. Only 2,000 for rocket, but there are eight rockets per Corsair, and the Corsairs launch in a 3x3 three three setup, which means they're lobbing 24 rockets at destroyers when you really want to, and uh, let me tell you, the Lexington rockets are no joke. You can be chunking destroyers for 8,000, 9,000 very easily, and if you're if they happen to be very unlucky, you can hit them for up to 12,000, 15,000. So overall, as a result, the Lexington is by far one of the most tier agnostic carriers. You have HE munitions, which are naturally more tier agnostic, and all of those HE munitions are able to penetrate basically anything that they need to. And so as a result, the Lexington gets an S rating in the parameter of tiering sensitivity. Now in terms of endurance, the Lexington does fall a little bit behind here. She has large squadron sizes, 16, 16, and 16. Regeneration times are also pretty good, 69, similar to the Shokaku. 72 on the torpedo bombers, a little bit longer. And 60 seconds on the rocket planes, so pretty much identical to the Shokaku. With slightly more durable planes. And slightly longer regen times, but also slower traverse speeds. And in this game, speed is better than HP. Because speed both cuts down on your travel time. Excuse me. Speed both cuts down on your travel time and also increases your durability more effectively than an actual HP increase because you spend less time in AA. Still though, with similar squadron sizes, or deck space sizes to the Shokaku and similar regeneration times, and generally similar durability, she gets a likewise similar A rating for endurance. Now a long game can strip your squadrons fairly effectively, especially if you have to throw planes against a heavy AA target. As I mentioned just now, having relatively slow planes means that heavy AA targets will be more effective against your planes, 
whereas low AA targets will be less effective against your planes, so the Shokaku will be more able to attack targets that are heavy in AA and get out with some planes, whereas the but she will take more damage from targets that have comparatively less AA. Whereas the Lexington will be able to ignore targets that have lesser AA, but will feel a bit more of a punch into her reserves against targets with heavy AA. It's kind of the trade-off, but overall the two are similar in terms of endurance. Now in terms of flexibility, the, show, the Lexington is the king of flexibility. Uh, if you want a carrier that can basically do anything and attack anything for the reasons I mentioned, the, the Lexington is it. The rockets can attack any target, including battleships. And there's so many of the rockets that even with just 8% fire chance and just the 2,000 alpha per rocket, you're still chunking even battleships for like 16,000. And destroyers don't even joke with the Lexington's rockets, they will chunk you out. And even cruisers can take 8 or 9k chunks very, very easily, and you can use them to finish off targets because the rockets are fast. 214 knots. Corsair is an app. The Havar armed Corsair at tier 8 is an absolutely ridiculous aircraft. I really don't know why it exists in the state it does. And even the Enterprise rockets, which are kind of similar, they use the Hellcat, which is slower, but there's a 12 plane squadron, so it's a 3x4 setup that can attack up to 4 times. That also regenerates an absurd time, but even that Hellcat squadron only penetrates 27mm of armor. And by, by comparison, the 33mm of armor penetration on the rockets is absolutely absurd. The torpedo bombers, on the other hand, have 6400 alpha. So a nice good full alpha. Unlike the midway that comes after, which gets reduced to 5000, the triple torpedoes of the Lexington are pretty much the best torpedo bombers you're going to get in the American line. The Saipan's torpedoes are slightly superior in some ways, mainly just because you launch four of them at once. But the Lexington torpedoes overall are pretty much the best torpedoes you're going to ever see in an American aircraft carrier. They're really good against battleships, and they're serviceable against cruisers. And they can be used with some difficulty against destroyers, but they can be used. And they do excellent damage, and they have decent flood chance, so there's nothing much else to say there. So a average to above average torpedo bomber squadron, a S tier rocket plane squadron, and then the dive bombers are absolutely disgusting. So you didn't see, I didn't show any clips there where I got full damage, but full damage on Lexington bo Dive Bomber Squadron for HE Dive Bomber on a unsaturated target is 18,000. And that's 18,000 with 6 bombs with a 57% fire chance, so often you'll be setting... You're almost guaranteed one fire, and oftentimes you can set anywhere between 2 to 4 fires with just a single pass. So the Dive Bombers are absolutely disgusting. And with 53mm of penetration, they penetrate everything. So in terms of flexibility, the Lexington is a god-tier carrier. It just attacks anything with impunity, and so as a result, it receives an S rating in flexibility. <clears throat> now moving forward, with all these parameters in mind, a carrier that can attack any kind of target will have god-tier carry power. The Lexington is an absolute beast at carrying. However, even though she can attack any target and deal damage, you have to get the planes onto the target, and so this is where her slow speed kind of lets her down a little bit. Because she is a little more sensitive to high-tier AA because of the relatively slow planes on the carrier, she's if her planes can reach the target, she will deal damage. This is obviously excellent for your carrying power. However, her munitions are all HE damage, so unlike the Shokaku, which has AP dive bombers and torpedoes, both of which are pretty much unhealable types of damage, so I don't know if you know this, but Citadel damage for battleships is basically only healable to 10%, which is nothing, and for cruisers is 33%. So that's the emphasis of the Shokaku. So Shokaku does less damage, but the damage is, for its primary squadrons, the AP dive bombers and the torpedo bombers, is unhealable. The Kaga's primary squadron, if you're having a good game, is torpedo bombers, which are again unhealable. And then its dive bombers are HE, which are healable to a much greater extent. I believe it's 33% for HE penetrations, and then fire damage is fully healable. The Lexington only has one type of unhealable damage, the torpedoes. Its bombers use HE bombs. Now, granted, they do a massive amount of HE damage, which is kind of disgusting, but you can still heal most of that damage back, which means that if you don't actually kill a target and you just cripple it and set it on fire, say you hit a battleship and you burn him for 20k after alpha-hamming 
after hitting him for an alpha of 15,000 because you've got a double fire that sticks onto him. You can still heal all of the fire damage that you dealt and 33% of that bomb damage. So as a result, even though it seems like with the flexibility of the Lexington to attack any target with all three of its squadrons, it should have S tier carry power, it ends up for me getting only an A rating because if you cannot finish a target and target survives to limp away, there is a good chance that they're going to heal up and they're going to continue to play the game. Whereas if you cripple someone in a Shokaku, Uh, with that damage, even though it's less overall damage, because it's not healable, it's actually about the same. So, as a result, the Lexington receives an A tier in carry power. The slow speed, which the slow speed and the healability of its damage that it deals, kind of holds it back a little bit in that regard. But overall, you can see Lexington <laughs> comes out very, very nicely with an A in hull performance. S in tiering sensitivity, A in overall endurance, S in flexibility, and A again in carry power. So these three carriers, roughly equivalent. Uh, the fact that Lexington is free and a tech tree carrier does count for a little bit for something. Same goes for the Shokaku. But overall, a very, very strong carrier. As you can see, thus far, the three carriers that we reviewed, not a single bad carrier amongst them. They're all excellent, especially when they're used in their specifically intended roles. Now we're going to move on to the Saipan. And then after I do the Saipan, I will go very briefly over the Enterprise. I will talk about how she behaves. Uh, I don't own the Enterprise, so I can't show you the characteristics in port, but I'm going to compare her to the Lexington. So actually, I've decided that I will talk about it now. So hull performance-wise, the Enterprise is a Yorktown class carrier. I really wish I had extended tech tree installed right now because I would be able to show you the Enterprise over here, but I don't. But as a Yorktown class carrier hull, she sits lower in the water and I believe she has better concealment than the Lexington. Okay, I, I, am I showing you anything? Did I click back onto the client? No, I didn't. Okay, so you were looking at a blank document, so. <clears throat> that is fine. I don't actually have an enterprise to show you anyway. So let me just pull it up on the Wargaming Wiki instead. That's probably a far superior method of going about doing this rather than showing you an empty graphic. If Wargaming's Wiki would ever load. Okay. So you can see, durability-wise, 51,000 hit points, so 9,000 less than the Lexington, not great. And then a 90 on the short range, 180 on the mid range, and a 95 on the long range. Remember, the Lexington had a whopping mid range of something like 612 DPS, so better AA on the Lexington. However, size-wise, she is a bit of a smaller carrier. And slightly slower, and her detectability from the surface is 14 with no modules. You end up taking Concealment Expert on most American captains. So the full build, unlike the 13 of the Lexington, will end up being 12.5, so slightly better concealment. So overall, that puts her at probably a B, maybe a B plus, but probably about the same as the Shokaku. Worse than the Lexington because A is much, much worse. But still not quite as bad as the Kaga. Now in terms of tiering sensitivity, the Enterprise gets a pretty much S rating. So she's kind of like a mix of Kaga and Lexington, if you can think of it that way. So her regeneration times are kind of disgusting. Let me put this away. Can I see the planes on this stupid ass client? So I can't see all of the loadout characteristics on Wargaming Wiki. So maybe I should use a different website. One second. Okay, we're going to use Pro Ships. 
you can ignore the part where I didn't remember the URL. Okay, not last numbers, please. Okay, and I don't want to look at this. And you get to laugh at me, because I'm not very good at remembering the stuff. Okay. Please give me ship stats. Okay, thankfully I have some idea of how to do this. And I need American ships. And I need Enterprise. Why are there two forms of Enterprise? So one of these is Rebrick Enterprise and the other is not Rebrick Enterprise. Hopefully it's the second one. Okay, we don't have loadout options, so it's probably this one. Maybe. I'm really hoping that this is updated. So it uses tier 7 aircraft just like the Kaga. And you can see the HP values before survivability expert and such are very similar to the Lexington's. They're slightly lower, it's similar to the Lexington's stock plane. Speed wise, fairly similar to the Lexington, so very slow aircraft. But overall, it has large squadrons and AP bombers. kind of wish I could select this, but it looks like I don't have a choice in the matter. Can't really click these in, so that's kind of, that is kind of rough. But anyway, AP dive bombers, and similar torpedoes to the Lexington, they're pretty much exactly the same, except the plane delivering is slower. And then the AP dive bomber is obviously more sensitive to tearing than the Lexington. So because she has AP munitions, and as opposed to HE munitions, she has a lot more targets that she might overpen when she's top tier and targets that she can't bend when she's bottom tier because the AP dive bombers on the Enterprise aren't particularly good. Also, I realized I rated it in the side fans slot. Uh, so overall, she's slightly more sensitive to tiering than the Lexington. However, uh, in spite of that, she has enormous squadrons and very, very, very short regen times. Some of the best regen times in the game, which is part of what makes her so broken. She can kind of throw planes at you over and over. Fun. Uh, similar to the Kaga, but instead of it being in the case of the Kaga where these squadrons are very large and they just sustain that hit, those hits over and over, it's that her regen times are very short and so she just makes more planes. She just prints them out. So as a result, we're going to give her an A plus rating, kind of similar to the Kaga. Not quite as insensitive to tiering as the Lexington, but very, very close. In terms of endurance, she gets an S rating, just like the Kaga. Again, for the reasons I listed before. Uh, not because she has enormous reserves, but because her regeneration times are so short that you can just throw planes at a target and not care. In terms of flexibility, she is not quite as flexible as the Lexington. She doesn't have those HE munitions after all. But she is about the same as the Shokaku. Shokaku is actually roughly analogous to the uh, Enterprise overall, but is kind of slightly more balanced and is a tech tree ship, which is why it hasn't been removed from the game. And so you get those HE rockets, I don't know if you remember, but the HE rockets are a 12 plane squadron, which launch similar numbers of rockets to the Lexington. So I believe it's 18 instead of the Lexington 24, I think it's 6 rockets per plane, and the rockets only have 27 millimeters of penetration, which makes them more limited. However, the torpedo bombers and dive bombers do exist, so the rockets, it's kind of like the cargo where you use the rockets on the Enterprise for destroyers and superstructure hits and setting fires, you use torpedoes against battleships and cruisers where applicable, and then, use the, and then you use the AP dive bombers against large targets. In this case, as opposed to the Kaga using her dive bombers against small targets. So the Enterprise uses her squadron of the AP dive bombers against large targets, like ru large Russian cruisers and battleships, and you just hit the targets that way with those. So as a result, she ends up with a similar flexibility rating to the Shokaku. It's, Enterprise is kind of like a American Shokaku on steroids, as you can see so far, by her having similar or, or identical or better ratings in all categories right now.
So carry power. <clears throat> How capable is the Enterprise of carrying? Is she the same as the other carriers? Well, no, she's an Enterprise. She's been removed from the game and she has an S rating in carry power. So why does she have an S rating in carry power? Even though I can't show you any of the planes and show you any of the stats. Well, her planes are similar to the Lexington, but they are slightly slower and they are slightly less tanky. But she has more of them. She has similar starting squadron sizes, but regeneration times that are about 10 to 15, I think it's closer to 10 seconds better in pretty much all cases. The damage output of the squadrons is similar. The torpedoes are pretty much exactly the same, so she shares the same 3x3 setup with a 6400 alpha per torpedo. And the rocket output for damage is similar used against the applicable targets. So, so thus far the damage output is similar, but she has more planes on demand, so she's more resistant to getting deplaned. And throughout the match she'll have access to more planes. So where does the extra S, S rating carry power come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the Enterprise has AP dive bombers, and AP dive bombers are AP munitions. And as we mentioned when I talked about that brief preamble about Lexington's HE dive bombers, AP dive bombers deal damage all at once. And AP dive bombers deal damage that can't be healed. And the Enterprise has a 3x3 three three AP dive bomber loadout, I think. It might be 3 by 4 but the point is the attacking squadron is a 3-plane attack squadron. Each plane carries 2 bombs, and each bomb hits for 5,000 damage. So the total AP Alpha of the Enterprise is a lovely... Well, it used to be 30,000, but I think it got nerfed during the global AP dive bomber nerf. Sorry about that in the background. I think it was nerfed by the same 17 or so percent that all carriers received, so it hits probably for roughly around 25,000 alpha as opposed to the former 30,000 alpha. In comparison, the Shokaku hits for 18,000 maximum damage, more or less. <coughs> I think it's 18,600 technically, but it's, you get the point. So hitting someone for 25,000, which what used to be a meme when people got hit by Hakaryu, the former Hakuryu Alpha was the 25,500, is obviously a big deal because you can instantly wipe half of a cruiser's HP off of the face of a planet and you can kill a battleship in two or three passes by itself with just the AP dive bombers. So being able to delete people with alpha damage is a big deal because when people lose all their HP at once, they don't get a chance to use their heal consumables. And in the case of AP munitions, even if they do, they only heal 10 to 33% of that HP back. So having access to a weapon that instantly removes people off the face of the planet is a bit of a big deal. And so that is why the Enterprise receives her S rating. She has munitions that deal good damage, that can't be healed, they deal it all at once. It's not done with fires or HE damage. And her squadrons have enough flexibility to get the job done, similar to the Kaga, where it's, you just reach for the right squadron for the right target and you will deal damage. And if you screw up, well, you have high regeneration times. So those planes will come back and you can just attack them again. So S rating in carry power. And that's that. That's the Enterprise. So next up is the Saipan. So first up on the Saipan, you will note that from a macro perspective, she is very small. You have the Lexington, who is very large. Doesn't even fit on my screen when I rotate around because she's so large. And you have the Saipan, who is a little teensy little thing. Quite a bit smaller. If we use the same level of scaling, which requires me to zoom out a couple of times for the Saipan, she is significantly smaller. Armor layout wise, she is absolutely unarmored. She is a cruiser hull. You can see 16mm deck in this case, with 19mm plate, barely any armor at all. And citadel wise, a uh, very small citadel because she is the size of cruiser, but it is raised above. So fairly accessible and no armor plates at all. So armor-wise, not looking great. 
Moving on to HP, 5,100 puts her as fairly squishy, kind of similar to the Enterprise. 9,000 less than her counterpart, the Lexington. Uh, however, more importantly than the 9,000 missing HP, you only have 4% torpedo bulge. So when you're taking damage from an enemy carrier, which does happen, as you will see later, you're going to take a lot of damage from the torpedo bombers because people usually attack carriers with torpedoes. Uh, especially at higher tiers, you're going to start not attacking carriers with bombs and rockets because they get armored deck. Now at tier 8, rockets can still damage most carriers, the Saipan especially, because she has no armor. Uh, but torpedo bombers are one of the most effective armaments against carriers, so you're going to take a lot of torpedoes quite frequently. And with 4% torpedo bulge production compared to everyone else, which is at least 15+, plus, you're going to be taking 10% more damage per torpedo, at the very least. In the case of Saipan versus Shokaku, which has a 25% bulge, you're going to be taking 20% more damage in comparison. And you have less HP, so pretty bad overall so far. Moving on to AA defense. 449, wow, that's that's pretty good. That's way better than the Shokaku, that's way better than Lexington, but you need to look at all the details. You can see that the firing range for the 340 kilometer aura is 3.5 kilometers, and this is because the Saipan only has 40 millimeter bofers. She doesn't have any long range mounts. So this also means she doesn't produce flak. So no flak buffs, and the AA engages at 3.5 kilometers, which means you're not going to be shooting down airplanes that are coming in on their way. You're relying pretty much just on your cap defense fighter, your self defense fighter, any other fighters you put down, and this uh, mid to short range aura, which the planes are only going to spend a couple of seconds in. So even though that AA aura at 449 is much, much better than the Japanese counterparts, it's way too short range to actually defend yourself. So we have a squishy hull with short ranged AA. So we better have some good parameters in the next few sets, otherwise we're going to be in trouble. 33 knots of speed, sub 1 kilometer turning radius, but a long rudder shift time of 16 seconds, and then 10.7 kilometer detection, so even better than the Shokaku, not quite as good as the, the Kaga. So these two parameters are fine. Pretty good speed, and good concealment. However, the hull is extremely vulnerable, and you take a lot of damage and you have no A. So overall, we're gonna give her a C. Our first C rating. Saipan Hall, pretty bad. Tier now we're gonna move on to our next parameter. Tiering sensitivity. How sensitive is the Saipan to movements in tiers? And I can tell you right now it's pretty damn sensitive. <clears throat> the Saipan is the exact opposite of the Kaga. The Kaga has enormous reserves with subpar regeneration time and that's how she gets through the match. She just throws large squadrons of planes at targets and then she just works through her large reserves as much as she can but she kind of can't because the reserves are way too big. The Saipan on the other hand has tiny reserves so even fully moduled out you have 11 planes of each type. The Kaga on her torpedo bombers and bombers has 36 planes of each type. With a squadron of 12, a Kaga can reach for the same squadron of 12 planes three times without counting regeneration. The Saipan has squadrons of six planes. It has deck space of 11 planes. You can reach for a squadron of six planes roughly around like 1.7, 1.8 times. After your first time, if you lose every plane, you will not have a full squadron. That's literally just how it is on the Saipan. That's how she functions. As a result, if you lose aircraft, you are going to lose them basically forever, because in addition to having tiny ass squadrons, the Saipan has some absurdly long regeneration times. 111 seconds on the rockets, pretty bad, but that we're just getting started. 135 seconds on the torpedo bombers, and 128 seconds on the dive bombers, so over two minutes per plane. In two minutes, you will get one torpedo bomber and one dive bomber back. If you lose a squadron by flying a six-plane squadron to a through a flak of puff, that squadron is just gone forever, and you're just not going to have six planes. Those six planes are gone for 12 minutes. That's more than half the match. You're just never going to see them again, more or less. However, the planes are extremely fast. 221 knots on the Bearcats and 
170 on the torpedo bombs. Well, okay, well, the rockets are fast. The BTDs, on the other hand, are, like, average. But they are quite tanky. They're tier 10 aircraft, so they get a full tier 10 bonus from survivability expert, which is nice. Which puts you to a 1900 HP rocket plane, which is good. And 2300 torpedo bomber HP and 2600 dive bomber HP. So the HP is very good. So this is a similar model overall to the Lexington. You have slow-ish to average-ish planes, which are very tanky. So what this means is that they're much, much better versus low AA targets. Because rather than having high speed and low HP, they have low speed and high HP. So they're very, very strong against targets with low AA. You just fly in, you don't lose any aircraft, you hit the target, and you zoom out. However, versus targets with high AA, that can actually just surpass that HP advantage and kind of take advantage of your low speed, you tend to take losses. And the Saipan is a carrier that cannot take losses. So as a result, she is extremely powerful when she is top tier or on tier. But when she's bottom tier, she is quite a bit more difficult to play. If, if you lose aircraft to AA monsters like a Worcester, like a Holland, like a Friesland, these, these AA threats that you cannot necessarily counter, or you have to attack a target to try and win a game, but they're escorted by an AA cruiser, but you have to make the attack, you don't get those planes back. And even though you can make a pretty hefty hit because your munitions, as we'll move on to later, hit pretty hard, it really sucks to lose those planes. So, the Saipan tends to suffer quite a bit when she's bottom tier. Now, her munitions are agnostic to tiering. She has Tiny Tim rockets with 68mm of penetration that deal a buttload of damage, although the Tiny Tims have been since nerfed quite a bit by the reticle changes. And she has an excellent torpedo bomber squadron. It drops four torpedoes at once that hit for 6400, so very, very strong torpedoes, even though they arm a bit slowly. And then the bombs are midway bombs with 11,200 alpha and 67 millimeters of penetration. So even Sovetsky Soyuz and Kremlin will take damage from your bombs. They're stronger than the Lexingtons by quite a bit. So munitions, they're great. But the planes that they're carried on are a little bit fragile and very sensitive to tearing. So as a result, I'm going to have to give the Saipan a C rating on tearing sensitivity. It's very sensitive to tearing. That's just the nature of the Saipan. Now, having a low tiering sensitivity rating isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. It means that your experience is not as stable when you compare bottom tier games to top tier games. It doesn't mean necessarily that the carrier is horrific, right? Like moving into, if you judge the over overall parameters that we're judging by, hull characteristic is one of the least important, but tiering sensitivity is one of the most important. How stable is your experience going to be with different tiering? tiers of game. So the Saipan gets pretty bad grades here, but just because she has a bad grade doesn't mean it's bad overall. She's going to have high highs and low lows. That's what we're trying to get the gist of. Now when we move on to the next parameter of endurance, we already mentioned that she has low deck size and long regeneration time. So naturally she's going to have very low endurance in a match. The Saipan front loads her munitions in a game. She puts her impact, she puts, she focuses all of her impact into that small squadron and you really need to get it done with the small number of aircraft you have on board. When games go late, even when you're top tier, you will tend to lose some amount of aircraft over the course of the match. And if the game goes late enough, losing just even one aircraft per strike, one aircraft per strike, one aircraft per strike, by the time you reach 15 minutes, 17 minutes, you might not be fielding full squadrons anymore, even if you were top tier in a 6-8 to eight game. That's just the nature of Saipan. So her endurance is not that great. It's pretty poor, in fact. She front loads her damage into the early parts of the match. All of her squadrons hit extremely hard when they put their munitions out onto the target, but if she has to do it over and over and over because of that regeneration time, she can't do it. So as a result, her endurance gets a C rating. Not great. I might actually do D rating, to be honest. Just really poor endurance overall. Now in terms of flexibility, where does the Saipan stand? She has HE rockets, 
that pen everything. 68 millimeters of armor. You can pen a Sovetsky Soyuz, you can pen a Kremlin with 68 millimeters of armor. However, the rockets themselves use the Tiny Tim reticle and you only launch six of them, so they're somewhat limited against small targets. If they hit the destroyer, they will absolutely blast that destroyer, but it's hard to get enough of them to hit the destroyer that they feel effective. Each rocket plane on the Saipan carries only three rockets, and there's only two of them in an attack flight. It's a 2x3 squadron, unlike the 3x3 squadron that's on the Tiny Tims on a Midway, the tier 10 tech tree carrier. So as a result, they're not as flexible as they look, but Lexington's rockets are more effective against light targets, Saipan's rockets are more effective against heavy targets, and that's kind of what the Saipan is specialized toward. It's specialized toward larger, heavier targets compared to Lexington, which takes all kinds of comers. Nevertheless, the rockets still retain flexibility because they have the capability of going after destroyers if they absolutely have to. And if you have to use them against battleships, you absolutely can. And if you have to use them against an armored cruiser with 50mm sides, I'm looking at you, Petropavlovsk, Stalingrad, that kind of thing, you absolutely can. They're perfectly effective. Torpedoes are excellent. Now, they are still slow. I'm not running the torpedo speed mod modules, which is why they only do 40 knots with this build. But they retain that 64,000 alpha. Now they are a very slow arming reticle. If I compare them to the Lexington's reticle, they are a little more picky and finicky. So if we finish with the Lexington over here. We go to this Saipan video over here. Quite a good mute myself here. So unlike the Lexington, there's quite a bit of lead up. You can see the cone starts quite wide. So that was just a pre-drop here. As we follow, okay, I guess I should pull this up for you guys so it's a little easier to see. So the cone starts quite wide and it takes a long, long time to narrow if I were to make an attack one of these sentries. The planes are cruising quite slowly at 134 knots, you can see, and closing on a target. Like, unlike the Lexington, which is quite flexible, I'm popping my heel here to resist damage. You can see the tanky planes catching. So the torpedoes get quite narrow if you can sustain the drop and get onto the target. I think there's an earlier drop on this Monarch. So you can see here, cone starts quite wide, takes a while to narrow, and you can get it to be very narrow. So the torpedo performance is quite good. Arming distance, however, is quite long, as you can see, much, much further than the Lexington's. Coming around against another target, that wide even though the cone gets quite narrow, at an angle, you can't miss torpedoes. Coming in again, you have to hold her quite steady. The tankiness of the planes allowing the Saipan's torpedo bombers to survive quite easily, and then delivering a nice focused punch. So overall, torpedoes are quite good. And in fact, perform the or provide the core of the Lexington's experience. The bombs, on the other hand, are more similar to the Kagas. So if we skip forward here, to a bit of a dive bomb attack, you can see the reticle quite focused, about the same size as the Kagas, dropping the same number of bombs, two aircraft dropping four bombs. However, unlike the Kaga, we have 67% fire chance and midway bombs, so you can see just four bombs slamming this Monarch for 14,000. This gets already saturated, by the way, so this is not even the full damage. Full damage sits at roughly... It's a little bit more than this. I think it's like 16,000. So this is actually fairly close to full damage. So as you can see, the Lexington's six bomb dive bomb squadron actually ends up having more potential alpha. However, we're doing this with just four bombs, which ends up being a little bit wonky because dropping six bombs versus four bombs means that you have less actual rolls to set a fire. So it's slightly worse at fire starting and you have less saturation over an area. So the bombs are still obviously quite excellent, but you get a little more dispersion. This is obviously a nice perfect strike against a not moving very quickly Monarch, so this is the best case scenario. But if you drop against, say, a destroyer, dropping four bombs versus six bombs uh, does start to make a difference. The reticle is the same size, but you're dropping two less munitions, so you have less chances to hit that maneuvering destroyer. So as a result, even though the, the Saipan has similar HE munitions to the Lexington is a bit less flexible. The Tiny Tim rockets, as I said, are 
not always particularly able to attack the target. So given all those circumstances, I'm going to give flexibility about the same as a Kaga, maybe a little bit better. The squadrons are specialized, but the rockets are still able to attack heavy and light targets and such. Uh, actually, I, th I think I would do A minus. Saipan not looking so good so far. You can see quite sensitive to here. Pretty bad hull, really bad endurance, and pretty poor flexibility. However, we still have one rating left, and that is, of course, carry power. So the Saipan is actually extremely capable of carrying. And why is that? Well, it's because of all the things we said earlier. It delivers massive punching power all at once, and it front loads its performance. And in current metagame of World of Warships, front loaded damage is better than back loaded damage because matches are often short. So if you look at her rocket squadron, she delivers six rockets onto a target for 5,400. So the maximum alpha of one single rocket pass with 68 millimeters of penetration. So it's basically, if the rocket touches the ship, it's probably going to deal damage. So the alpha of that squadron is 5,400 by 6, which comes out to, was it 30,000, 32,400? And then you divide by 3 because it's penetration damage. So the alpha damage is basically 10,000 unmitigatable damage. This also has a 33% fire chance per rocket, so you're basically lobbing bombs at people. With six rolls of 33% fire chance, you have a good chance of setting a fire. So the rockets are a fairly good chance of setting fires. Compare that to the Lexington's rockets. You have 24 rolls of 8% fire chance and 2,000 alpha. So 24 by 2,000 is 48,000 alpha. And then you divide by 3 which gets you roughly 16,000 alpha. So the potential alpha of the Lexington is obviously much, much higher. But because you're launching so many little projectiles that can have the potential to hit belt armor or turret armor, there's a good damage, good chance you don't get full damage for every rocket. Some of them are going to shatter. So the effective damage is very similar. However, with 8% fire chance, that's much lower per roll. So even though it's similar to the Saipan in guaranteeing fire, it's through a very different method. So... Overall, the, the the effective alpha damage of the Saipan ends up being quite a bit higher on the rockets. So torpedo bombers, as we mentioned, we have one whole extra torpedo on a cone that gets narrower. So as a result, we can use the cone that's more narrow against smaller, slimmer targets than the Lexington. And the plane itself that carries it is not only a little bit faster, but also tankier. It has access to that same heal, so you can force your way through AA regardless of the size of the squadron. And so, that front-loaded Saipan damage can be delivered in much heavier bursts with the Torpedo Bombers. And then the Dive Bombers are roughly equivalent. So we have better Torpedo Bombers, uh, slightly more target agnostic rocket planes that can attack any target, and Bombers that can tackle any target. And so as a result, even though the Saipan has all of these failing grades in hull performance, and endurance, and sensitivity to tiering, she still has pretty much A plus tier to S tier carry power. When she is top tier, as the American model of high HP planes and low speed dictates, she will not lose aircraft, and if she doesn't lose aircraft, then her alpha damage is never affected, and if her alpha damage is never affected, she has best in class alpha damage. Outside of the Saipan's, or sorry, outside of the Enterprise's absurd AP dive bombers, she has S tier alpha damage, 24,000 plus torpedo alpha damage is more than any other carrier can deliver at once outside of the Enterprise. The only thing keeping her, holding her back in terms of carry power is that when she's bottom tier, she's going to lose planes. But even when you're bottom tier and you lose planes, you can still deliver that front loaded damage. And delivering damage is basically the most important feature of a carrier. And if you can effectively deliver damage, then you can carry a game by just flat out killing someone. And the Saipan, when push comes to shove, is more than capable of flat out killing someone. And so that's why I give her that A plus carry power rating. So as an overall look at the Americans, you can see a bit of a dichotomy. You, you get the Lexington, which is just excellent across the board, accessible as a tech tree carrier in these categories. And then you get the Enterprise, which is basically better, 
even than the election ten. You're trading your trading sensitivity to tiering for being able to carry harder. And you're trading flexibility for being able to carry harder and while well, carrying a game. So all of these parameters are nice. Hall performance is obviously a soft stat, and you don't you don't really care, but it's kind of worth mentioning. And then these middle such as these middle characteristics of tiering sensitivity, endurance, and flexibility are kind of equally weighted. But carry power and the ability to win a game is most heavily weighted at the very end here. So having the highest rating here is the most important. So we have three ships with scaling carry power. And then in terms of ease of use, you have the Lexington that's the easiest to use, kind of tied with the Enterprise. And then Saipan is hard to use, but when you can use it, utilize it properly, it has extremely high carry power. And oh my goodness, this video is going to be taking a while, so let me get some water one brief moment. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. Roughly halfway, so bear with me as we keep going in this mission. So next up is going to be the Implacable. The British Tech Tree Tier 8 Implacable. So let's pull up Whilst Client one more time. Okay, I technically was supposed to do the Germans first, but we're going to do British because they released earlier. So this is the Tier 8 British Aircraft Carrier Implacable, first of the two armored carriers. So we're actually going to see some changes in the armor layouts for once. Pulling this back up, the British carriers are armored carriers, as I mentioned. Pretty standard side plates and belt. However, if you look at the deck, unlike all the other Tier 8s, you have 25mm and 21mm deck armor, but then you get a midsection of 38. And 38 is an important number because 38 is more than 32. And 32 is standard battleship plating. And standard battleship plating bounces pretty much all AP in the game, or outside of Yamato and Musashi. Or, so 38 being greater than 32 means that this deck plate bounces basically all AP. Now as for HE, it does shatter a very good amount of HE. IFHE 155 and 152mm HE, for example, will shatter on 38. 203mm, or 8 inch HE, also shatters on 38. And this midsection strip is 76, and 76 basically shatters most effective HE outside of very specific stuff like German battleship AP. British Battleship AP, or sorry, British Battleship HE and German Battleship HE. And it also shatters bombs. So those target agnostic HE bombs that I mentioned on the Kaga, Lexington, Saipan, they all shatter on 76mm. And those target agnostic Lexington rockets, which beat 33mm of penetration, shatter on 38mm plate as well. So the hull is quite a bit more substantially armored than other carriers. Which means that at long range you can bounce AP, which gives you resistance against carrier sniping. And in carrier versus carrier engagements, this middle section of your hull is immune to HE damage. So you cannot take rocket damage on this area of this ship, and you cannot take HE bomb damage, and it also resists AP bomb damage. Now if you strip away the armor, the Citadel is large and it's raised, so don't show your side. You're an armored carrier, but you want the shells to bounce off your deck, not plunge through your unarmored sides and hit your citadel. So overall, armor is better than most carriers, but you still have to be a bit careful. HP-wise, is sitting pretty much middle of the pack at 55,000, but 34% torpedo bulge protection, so very good bulge protection and decent HP. AA defense-wise, 460 rating. Pretty good. And it does have long range. Now the AA is still focused on mid-range aura, but that's the case for most carriers. Only 4 plus of flak, but they do come out at 5.8 and they do a decent amount of damage. But overall, decent AA. Better than the Shokaku by quite a bit. Not quite Lexington tier, but good AA. Maneuverability wise, 32 knots of speed, so good speed. Slightly below 
that of Lexington and such, but still fairly serviceable, still able to outrun most battleships by a little bit. 950 meter turning circle is better than most of the colossal turning circles of the American and Japanese carriers, and 13.5 rudder shift is slightly better than the Americans. Concealment, not too hot, sitting at 14.5, so this is the same as the Lexington, and just like my Lexington, I'm missing concealment experts. So again, it goes down to 13 with the full build. So same concealment as the Lexington, however, on a relatively smaller ship with much more armor. So overall, uh, this is going to be our first A plus tier hull performance. Now, I guess you could technically put it as S, kind of best in tier hull performance if you want to. It's kind of semantics. But since hull performance isn't weighted that much, I figured I would go with A at first. But upon thinking about it and talking it through with you guys on this video, I guess I'll just put an S. It's effectively best in tier, so what the heck. S means best in tier, so we put S for overall hull characteristics. Moving right along. How sensitive is the implacable to tiering? Tiering sensitivity. And for that, we look at its aircraft. So, rocket aircraft, 2300 HP. Wow, that's great. Eight, 180 nozzle speed. Eh, that's alright. Rockets in payload 10, 2350 alpha. That is good. HE shell armor penetration, 28 millimeters of penetration and 10% fire chance. So that's not so great. So we launched 20 rockets per pass. They have a 2300 alpha, so that's basically more theoretical alpha in a rocket pass than the Shokaku. However, it's launched over two planes, which means the cone is slightly less spread, so it's a little more picky. In addition, it has similar penetration, so overall similar rockets to the Shokaku. They're average. They're very good against destroyers, and against other targets, they're pretty whatever, just mostly for setting fires and dealing with chip damage. Torpedo bombers. 2350 HP. Wow, that's good. However, the speed is bad. 172 knots. So, as we mentioned with the American carriers, when you have high HP and low speed, you're great against targets of shit AA, and you're kind of crap against targets of high AA. So we're following the American model. How does our actual torpedo look? So we have a 2x4 setup. So two torpedoes at once, and 5900 alpha. So the alpha is inferior to both the Americans and the uh, Japanese. So that's unfortunate. How's the torpedo speed? 42 knots of speed means they're a little less flexible. They're slow torpedoes. And then regeneration time, 88 seconds. Wow, that's pretty long if you compare to the slightly over 60 for most of the Japanese and American planes. So torpedo bombers, not a great outlook. I will note, however, that in terms of their general performance, the torpedo bombers are pretty good. Oh, okay. Looking, forgot to mute here. Let's find some torpedoes. So the British torpedoes are a bit unique. Okay, those aren't torpedoes. Let me find a torpedo bomber pass. Torpedo, British torpedo bombers are unique at this tier for having converging torpedoes if I would ever launch them. So we see that 2x4 setup, so two torpedoes at once. Fairly tanky, but you can see me cruising at a fairly pedestrian 172 knots of speed, even while boosting. Now the key thing about British torpedoes is that they have short arming distance, and they are fairly agnostic to maneuvering. So I'm going pretty straight here, but you can see the torpedoes narrowing quite rapidly, and the arming distance is quite short, actually. If we pause here, you can see the arming distance between the Odin and this surface of the rock. That ar minimum arming distance required is somewhat less than the Odin, and the Odin is a relatively small battleship. So if you remember before when we were looking at the Kaga, which has a very long arming distance of greater than a Montana, it would probably be stretching out to about here. And this Odin would actually be approaching too close to this rock for me to attack with Kaga torpedoes. But for the implacable, we can get quite onto it. As well, you can see the shape is slightly converging. And this converging pattern means that targets at the very end are quite a bit uh, more vulnerable 
Now, this convergent pattern also makes you vulnerable to torpedoes being shorted, but it does make uh, bow on approaches like this a little bit easier. The spacing can be quite wide or quite narrow. It kind of varies right now on the current patch thanks to the bugs, but you can see that converging pattern does allow me to score two torpedo hits on this Odin, where I otherwise would normally just score one. So overall, the plane carrying the torpedo is pretty sensitive to tearing, but um, the torpedo itself is quite good. Now moving on to the bombs. The bomber is, again, kind of slow, 169 knots, tanky though at 2600 HP. It's a 5300 alpha bomb. There's 8 bombs in a payload in a 2x3 setup. So that's 16 bombs. So that's pretty good, and that's a lot of bombs. The theoretical alpha of 16 bombs that hit for 53,000 is somewhere in the realm of 80,000 damage, 90,000 damage. That's pretty disgusting. That's the alpha, by the way, so if you do the actual pen damage, divide by 3, it's closer to something like 25,000-ish alpha, but that's a very large number. That's kind of like the Enterprise AP Dive Bomber alpha. So what's the problem? Well, first of all, if we stay here on the client and look at the characteristics, 32 millimeters of penetration, and I do hope that I have the client up. Yes, we do. Okay. So if 32 millimeters of penetration means that you exactly beat battleship plate thresholds. So against 32mm armored battleships, that's British and French, as well as any bows and sterns of basically any battleship and stuff like the Amagi and such. However, Americans at tier 8 start getting 38mm midsection plate, and Russians like the Vladivostok and Kremlin and Sovetsky Soyuz have that 60mm midsection plate. Germans for a while have been having 40 and 50 millimeter midsection plates, which means you can't effectively damage those ships. Cruisers you can still effectively damage, but as I will show you, the size of the reticle means it's very difficult to damage cruisers, and destroyers is even more difficult. So if we flip back onto our sample clips, we will see an attack on a North Carolina at some point. I don't know what I'm... I think I'm attacking the Odin here, which is a good example. So remember, I have 32 millimeters of penetration with this level bomber squadron, and we're going to attack this Odin. The Odin's a German battleship with 50 millimeter midsection plates. And so as a result, we are going to get a fair number of shattered bombs of the bombs that we arm here. So we're approaching. Now we're arming that level bomber. You can see the level bombers take a fair bit longer time to arm. Now I just want to point something out here as we approach. Watch the size of the reticle and compare it to the Odin. How big is our reticle? It's actually longer than the Odin, so it's almost impossible for me to deliver all 16 bombs onto the target. I'm leading here. Since there is a bomb delay, you can see them dropping in the two rows. And how many bombs am I going to get onto the target? So I just dropped 16 bombs onto a target. Now I didn't get a perfect alignment, admittedly, but it was a pretty decent alignment across the surface area of his ship. And with 16 bombs, you can see them splashing all around the water around him. I actually only contacted him with 4 out of 6 of the bombs. So I just went from that 25,000 theoretical alpha to a quarter of that. So that's around 6,000 to 6,500 alpha. So that's 6,500 alpha HE with 4 bombs that penetrate. Now, of those four bombs that pen that contacted the Odin, two of them hit sections of the ship I don't actually pen. I got two pens and two non-pens. And so we take that 6,500 damage and cut it in half again, and now our alpha damage to the Odin overall after making the attack was 3,500. Less than that, actually, but let's say 3,500. So we just spent all that time with this slow plane flying over to this Odin, made an attack with a reticle that's the size that's bigger than his ship and we hit him with four bombs and did 3500 damage if i made the same attack with kaga dive bombers with that 8800 alpha bomb per bomb so 8800 times four divided by three or yeah times four divided by three is something like 8000 damage if we land all four bombs if we land half of that we're still doing 4000 damage that's still more than the implacable. And the Kaga planes are faster 
much, much faster at about 187 knots compared to the 172. Compared with the Lexington, if I came over with my Lexington dive bombers and hit them with four bombs, they probably would have all penetrated unless they hit turret plate. And with the 9200 alpha of the Lexington bombs, four bombs hitting and penetrating would have done 12,000 damage onto that Odin. That's four times more. Da that's more or less four times more damage. So that's kind of the nature of the implacable carpet bomber or level bomber. You can see me here again in this clip as we jump forward, attacking a North Carolina again. North Carolina not quite as heavily armored, unlike the German 50 millimeter plate. He only has 38 millimeter plates, and he's moving backwards very slowly. You can see the reticle again is larger than his whole ship, and so I hit him with seven bombs. And I hit two fires. That's not bad. Not bad. So, but only seven of the bombs contacted out of 16. So less than half again. And what did I get with the seven bombs? I got one penetration on the nose of his ship. And six bombs hit the midsection of 38mm armor. And they are six non-penetrations. So I hit him with seven bombs and I did something like 1700 damage. Yes, I set two fires. But I did 1700 damage only. And that's a bit of a problem. So this means that when I'm not topped here and I'm not attacking ships that are that have less than 32 millimeters of armor, the implacable starts to suffer quite a bit. So you end up with being quite sensitive to tearing. And in addition to all that, you have these long regeneration times, like I said. 88 seconds, 106 seconds on your overall bomber squadron regeneration. So, as a result, the implacable ends up being quite sensitive to tearing. When you have lots of heavily armored ships, you tend to suffer. When you have lots of lightly armored ships, you tend to do pretty good. Games without large unarmored battleships, the implacable will tend to do not that great. So, as a result, I'm going to give her a similar rating to the Saipan in this and give her a C. Excuse me. Moving on from that, our next statistic is endurance. And as you might suspect, the Lexington, the Implacable has similar plane characteristics to the Lexington's squadrons. Except, unlike the Lexington's 16, 16, 16 loadout, she has an 11, 14, and 11 loadout. So you're missing four or five aircraft per section of aircraft, or up to four aircraft, I guess, up to four or five. You're, you have close tor massive torpedo bombers, but still not great. In addition, your regeneration times for each type of aircraft are roughly 20 to 30 seconds longer. And 20 to 30 seconds over the course of a match translates to being three or four less aircraft of each type to have access to compared to Lexington. Uh, the squadrons are also small, and even though they're tanky, they're not tanky enough to survive flak bursts. These aren't uh, FDR planes at tier 10. They're just slightly tankier to survive regular continuous damage. Doesn't really make a difference for flak damage. So as a result, with definitely below average regeneration times and slow plane speed, the endurance of the implacable comes into question as well. And this is further emphasized when she's bottom tier, of course. When she's top tier, the reserves are manageable, but kind of similarly to the Saipan, as you, as you lose small amounts of planes over the course of a match, you start to very easily feel the impact of those plane losses. And so as a result, the implacable will get a B minus rating, or maybe even I'll probably just give it a C. We'll give her a C rating in endurance. Now flexibility is the next characteristic that we're going over. And as I mentioned, we have torpedoes, which are good, converging torpedoes, but they're a bit slow, so they're not great against destroyers in particular because they lack the speed to deal with them. But they are quite good and hard to dodge for cruisers and battleships. They don't hit that hard, but they are effective. So. Torpedoes overall pretty good. 
Rockets, on the other hand, are quite limited. As we mentioned, with only 28mm of penetration, they are similar to Shokaku rockets in all respects. So, fairly average for the tier. Definitely nothing like the American rockets at all. Uh, good for setting fires and light targets, but that's about it. And then the bombers are... You would think they're pretty flexible. They are, after all, an HE mission. <laughs> but HE has its pros and cons. The pros are that you just have to touch a target to damage it. You don't have to think about penetration as with AP bombers. However, unlike AP bombers, the damage is healable. It's a high explosive bomb. Which means it's mostly healable by most targets other than destroyers. However, that HE bomb is not particularly effective against destroyers because that reticle is larger than the size of a battleship. So if you have trouble hitting battleships where you have situations like when we were attacking that Odin, where we only hit four bombs out of 16. You can imagine that when you're attacking destroyers, often you'll only hit one or two bombs, which means you're going to be doing some pathetic damage with the bombs. So the bombs are actually pretty much completely ineffective against destroyers. Against cruisers, if you're only hitting four bombs on a maneuvering battleship of 16 bombs, well, with, against cruisers, again, you're only going to be hitting two to three bombs, and you're going to be doing pitiful amounts of damage, unlike the much more precise armaments of the Lexington and Kaga in terms of HE dive bombers. So again, not too great against cruisers. That leaves battleships. So battleships, when you're not unlucky, like versus that strike on the Odin, and you manage to hit all of your bombs, they actually tend to do pretty good damage, if they can beat the armor thresholds. As you saw on that North Carolina strike where I got six shatters in one penetration, if you attack a target that's uh, higher than that 32mm armor threshold, the implacable is sadly quite limited. So as a sum total, the implacable ends up being relatively inflexible. She has to be very picky about her targets. And so as a result, we're going to give her a C rating in flexibility. Sadly, not the most flexible of carriers in terms of targeting. And that leaves carry power as our last parameter. So how capable is the implacable of carrying a match with slow planes that have to be picky about targeting? Well, spoiler alert, when you have low alpha damage on your actually reliable weapon, the torpedoes, and then you have relatively limited targeting on your rockets, if only 28 millimeters of penetration, and you have extremely limited targeting on your bombers in terms of the relative inaccuracy and low penetration power, you're going to get a low carry rating. And sadly, of the carriers that are in a given match, thus far, the implacable is going to be earning a C rating. She is an aircraft carrier. She can still carry a game. She does provide spotting. Her planes are tanky. She can deal with targets at all angles because she's an aircraft carrier. She can cross a map and globally attack a target. But compared to her peers, the implacable is sadly under-tooled to deal with enemy ships. And so as a result, we're going to give her a C rating in carry power. Just not the greatest. Compared to her peers, she's just not fantastic. Her squadrons are just a bit too limited. Now I guess I, I might bump her up to a C+, just because her rockets are pretty good against light targets these days. Uh, the reticle change, unlike for most carriers, where the rockets got nerfed by the reticle change, or unchanged in the case of the Lexington, the implacable reticle change actually helped her quite a bit in terms of getting a better spread pattern on her rockets and getting less saturation. Uh, but overall, her ability to carry a match is kind of just not there. Not there, unfortunately. She still manages to do carrier stuff, but just not the greatest. So that leaves us moving on to the Indomitable, and you'll excuse me for about 10 seconds as I take another sip of water. So, moving on, we have the Indomitable, the Premium Tier 8 carrier. So the Indomitable is also an armored cruiser. Uh, it's not one of the Implacable class. It's one of the, well, illustrious class carriers. 
And so as a result, she has a similar armor scheme to her tech tree sister. So we move over to armor scheme. Again, we have the same layout. Armored middle deck of 38 and 76, so it's the same similar characteristics to servability. And again, if I stripped away the plates, raised citadel, so don't show your side. Survivability is quite similar. 28% torpedo reduction, so a bit less than the 34 of the implacable, and a little less HP, unfortunately, for her. Ejectability, however, is much better than the 13 of the implacable at 11.8. Speed is slower at 30.5 compared to 32, and AA defense is a bit lower. So you're exchanging the hard survivability ratings of Torpedo Bulge, HP, and AA Defense for better concealment. And of these, concealment actually ends up being usually a better characteristic than all three of those hard survivability characteristics. You still have that armor, but overall the Implacable is, it, sorry, the Indomitable is similar enough to her half-sister, the Implacable, that I'm just going to give her the same S tier rating. She's a bit slower, but she has better stealth. So very similar overall. Now tiering sensitivity, we get to a whole different ballpark with the Indomitable. Now the Indomitable is a truly unique carrier in the game. She does not have torpedo bombers. She is the only carrier in the game right now that does not have torpedo bombers at all. She has these De Havilland Seahorns, which are extremely tanky. As you can see, 2300, just like the Sea Fires on the Implacable, and 2900, 999, so 3000 HP on her dive bombers. Or sorry, not dive bombers, but level bombers. Her planes are extremely fast, and they're extremely tanky. So if we remember our analogies, or our comparison metrics here, speed is preferable versus higher tier ships with heavier AA, and HP is preferable versus lower tier ships with lower AA. And in the case of the Indomitable, her planes are both tanky and fast, so she's just good into most types of AA. However, her munitions carried by, even though the aircraft platform is insensitive to tiering, the munitions are a different story. The rockets are inferior, 8 rockets per plane compared to 10 on the Sea Fires, and the same 2x3 setup, so you're launching four less rockets overall. The rocket has an alpha of 2100 as opposed to 2350, so less damage there again. And then again, you have the same 28 millimeters of penetration. And so, unfortunately, the rockets are actually worse than the implacables, which is kind of laughable. They're also carried on a plane that, while being extremely sw swift, lacks the maneuverability of British aircraft. British aircraft are usually quite maneuverable, that's one of their nice characteristics, but the implacable seahorners are kind of inflexible. They're very stiff and they don't turn very well. And so while this is fine for level bombers to be stiff, it's not so super important that they track their targets too well, it is important for rocket aircraft to be maneuverable. And sadly, the high speed sea fires are not great, or sorry, the sea hornets in that regard are not great. So the rockets are not fantastic. And with 28mm of penetration, they are kind of sensitive to tiering for the same reasons as those of the Shokaku and Implacable. The bombers, on the other hand, are somewhat different. So, you can see they don't have the 5400 alpha of the Implacable bombers. They only hit for 4700. In addition, you're dropping 6 bombs as opposed to 8 bombs per aircraft, so less bombs. And you share that 32mm of penetration and 34% fire chance. Although I guess the implacable this one has higher fire chance as well. So the bombs look worse on paper. But they are not for several key reasons, which I will show you through footage. So if we pull up our indomitable clip here, these are the indomitable level bombers. So you can see in straight line flight, 222 knots boosted. Oh, this is some fucking irony. I am mute myself again as we talk about some irony. So I'm going to attack a Massachusetts in this clip. And the Massachusetts has a very similar armor scheme to the North Carolina that we attacked earlier. So remember, it has a 38mm section, which is going to shatter these 32mm penetration bombs. However, two things keep the Indomitable from being an utter piece of trash. You 
what, we, what you're going to see me do here is make a slingshot attack onto the Massachusetts. This is where you use the immunity frames during the rearming of an attack to attack a ship and get through its AA without taking damage. High speed allows the indomitable planes to sail through very large amounts of space during that invulnerability period. And the high HP means that once you're out of it, you tend to survive getting onto the target. This means that the Indomitable tends to lose very few aircraft, irregardless of how much AA she is facing. So that's the first thing. The Indomitable is the only slingshot capable carrier. The second characteristic will appear as we make this attack, although you can kind of begin to see it on the surface of the water. Firstly, the bombs drop a little bit faster. It might actually be similar, but they seem to drop faster, but we'll ignore that and assume they're similar. The second factor is the reticle size. So, as the reticle passes over the Massachusetts here, I don't know if you saw there, but the Massachusetts is a fairly large battleship, a bit larger than an Odin from the last match in the Implacable. And if you recall, the reticle of the Implacable was larger than Odin. There's a reticle of the Indomitable, even though we're dropping four less bombs, is half the size of a Massachusetts. And so even though we get a similar result to that North Carolina strike, we land 9 out of 12 of our bombs. So compared to the 7 out of 16, where we landed less than 50% on that North Carolina, in a similar strike on this Massachusetts, we land 9 out of 12, 75% of the bombs. Yes, we don't get any fires in this case. Yes, we only get 2 pens and deal 2,800 damage. Yes, 5 of the bombs shatter. But that smaller reticle means you have more precision, and you can saturate areas of the target more easily. And it also means that these bombers allow you to can be used to attack cruisers and even destroyers if you aim with enough precision. Even though you're dropping four less bombs, the area is just so much smaller that you saturate that area relatively effectively with these dive bombers. So you see me here making another attack onto the Massachusetts with these fast aircraft. And so this Massachusetts is an on-tier target, but the Implacable is more than capable of attacking higher tier targets because that slingshot lets it cut through AA. And the bombs, being more precise, can be placed onto areas of ships that you can damage. You can place them onto just the bow of a Kremlin, for example, if you really need to attack a Kremlin. Or if you attack a Nagato, which is completely covered in 26 millimeter plate, you can just basically get full pens wherever the bombs hit. And you can see me here placing 8 plus 3 bombs, so 11 out of 12 of my bombs onto this target here. I only missed one bomb because the reticle is so much smaller. So I'm going to continue to use this footage here rather than use the port view actually because this talks. we can talk a bit about the implacable or indomitable's playstyle in comparison. Now the indomitable is an extreme specialist. She is perhaps the most specialized of all the tier 8 carriers. She is a dedicated fire starter with the combination of high speed aircraft and small squadron sizes and plane, planes that basically don't die mean that she can attack the same target over and over without losing aircraft at very short intervals and set fires over and over. Her whole playstyle is to just repeatedly firebomb the same target to tax that damage control and burn them to death. That's that's it. That's all she does. Destroyers, whatever. Ignore. The, she kind of tends to ignore those. You can see me ignoring that Bliskavika over there, even though I know he's there, even though I have rockets. My goal here is to just relight this Nagato. I know I got a fire on him before. I know he GCP'd. I just want to get some permanent fires going on this guy, deal that full nice raw pen damage since I know this target has less than 32 millimeters of armor. You can see me escaping here with the other two aircraft very easily. Uh, this aircraft still has 500 HP, enough for me to be bold enough to try and make a second pass on an Agado and get another permanent fire. So that's that's the playstyle of the Implacable, just set fires over and over, and this doesn't change between tiers. You don't have targeting changes between tiers, really. You can still attack battleships and destroyers, and still mostly avoid cruisers because they're not very efficient fire targets, rather than that because they're not strikable. And that's the Implacable in a nutshell. And so, as a result of these factors, the Implacable ends up being fairly resistant to tier, tier sensitivity. Now, she's not great 
when she's not a huge top. She's a huge top tier bully, and so she's not great when she's bottom tier, but she can still function. She can still find a target and set them on fire over and over, and it doesn't really matter that they're a tier 10 ship or a tier 8 ship. So I kind of went over the whole implacable, indomitable there, sorry, throughout that video. So I'm going to kind of brush through the rest of the characteristics. But what you should know, though, is that even though your planes are very tanky and you tend not to lose them, your regeneration times are b definitely below average. 104 seconds on your rockets and you only have 14 on deck, and you only have 10 bombers with 106 second regeneration time. So very, very, very small reserves. If you lose planes, you tend to lose them fairly quickly. This is mitigated by the fact that the planes tend not to die because the Indomitable can slingshot, so she avoids sharing the fate of the implacable with her c tier endurance rating but over a long match you will slowly lose planes especially when you're bottom tier so the indomitable comes out with a b plus endurance rating in terms of flexibility the indomitable is kind of trash she's really good at burning battleships she really is but her rockets are kind of horrific unlike the implacable's rockets which after the radical changes are actually pretty decent they're pretty bad And so, as a result, the Indomitable is really only effective at firebombing battleships and relatively immobile cruiser targets. You can handle destroyers with the level bombers, as I mentioned, but it's not particularly effective. If you get a good pass, you might get six to 10,000 damage, which is obviously not terrible at all, but other carriers can do that simply by just clicking on destroyers with their rockets, which is much less mechanically demanding and far more consistent. So. As a result, in terms of flexibility, she is not the most flexible carrier. Give her maybe B, B minus. It, I, I'm going to give her a B minus because it feels disingenuous to compare her to, to give her the same rating as a Kaga. She's flexible, but not that flexible. And in terms of carry power, the Indomitable only does HE damage. She mainly actually sets her damage by setting fires, and fires are fully healable. But she is kind of unstoppable in terms of slowly whittling down to targets that she does hit. But overall, being ineffective against destroyers, uh, even more so than potentially even the implacable, does hold back her carry power. She can carry in a very unique way, but it requires you play in a certain way and take advantage of her ability to repeatedly set people on fire and keep someone on fire. So, As a result, that does limit her carrying capacity. Uh, close games will be difficult for her, her to claw back. But in a game where you have a slight lead to her ability to continually harass someone and just firebomb them until they basically die, can definitely help you secure a game. So she's actually capable of carrying a game, but not particularly effective. So overall, I'm going to give her a B in that category. So after all that, if we look at our little table, she has again an S rating in hull performance, an A in tiering sensitivity, B plus in endurance, B minus in flexibility, and a B in carry power. So substantially superior to her tech tree counterpart, but you have to keep this in mind with a caveat that this is in a very specific manner. The Indomitable is only capable of doing one thing. If you cannot play the game to the firebombing style of the that the Indomitable demands, then the Implacable will actually be a better actual aircraft carrier. Because the Indomitable just is only capable of setting fires, if you end up in a match with mainly battleships that have too much armor for you to penetrate, so you're relying on fires, but let's say they're Russian and they have Russian damage control, so they never stay on fire. And there's a whole bunch of AA cruisers that you're not really likely to target that well. And there's a whole bunch of destroyers, which are not only not that reliable to target, but let's say they have really, really strong AA, like a Holland or a Smolland, that kind of deal. So targeting them is difficult. Then the Indomitable becomes quite a bit less potent because it's specialized against burning battleships, and that's how it carries a game. Now the battleship population of World of Warships is such that there's almost always a target for the Indomitable, but that's not always guaranteed to be the case, so there will be games where you're left feeling helpless and 
you come to the realization that, wow, I'd really rather be playing Implacable in this game, which is kind of amazing. And so that ends up producing this rating chart. Now moving on to the final nation, the youngest carriers in the game, the Germans. We're going to start with the tech tree Augustus von Parzival. So uh, I will note with a caveat that I do not have the Augustus von Parzival upgraded on this account. I actually played the Parzival on my alt and I think I have something like 70 to 80 games in her. So I do have a fair bit of experience, but excuse me if it looks like I have uh, not played too much on the Parsifal. I do have extensive Parsifal experience, just doesn't show here on this particular account. So survivability wise, with the fully upgraded hull, you end up having 54,000 HP. And I don't think the bulge protection changes, so 16% bulge protection, so about the same as a Shokaku, more or less. No special armor plates from what I saw, Although, you will note that the German carriers do have a turtle back, and this keeps them from being citadeled at long range. So they are slightly better than unarmored carriers in that regard. AA defense-wise, the Parsifal actually has pretty good AA. 374, but a good amount of it is focused into that medium range and long range. Only 5.2 on the long range, so somewhat limited there, but Still overall better than the Shokaku AA. And in terms of long range, 6 flak puffs is pretty good, even if it's only at 5.2. Maneuverability wise, 31.8 knots, large turning circle, and very, very large rudder shift time, so not great there. But the concealment is excellent again. Same as the Shokaku, well, more or less the same. 10.6 to its 10.7. So overall, with the combination of turtleback and average durability and good AA, we're going to give the Parsifal a B rating. Or B plus rating, I guess, since it's technically slightly better than the Shokaku. And in terms of tiering sensitivity, the Parsifal starts to suffer. So the Parsifal is a German tech tree aircraft carrier, which means it has AP rockets and German torpedoes and AP bombers. So AP rockets make you especially susceptible to tiering because you need cruisers in the game that you can penetrate. Now the rockets have enough penetration to pen most cruiser broadsides outside of a few key exceptions, such as spaced armor, British heavy cruisers, and that kind of thing. However, even minor angling can uh, mitigate much of the damage, and the planes have very, very low HP. So they are fast, and as I said, fast planes tend to mitigate heavy AA, but the planes are squishy enough, with lacking HP enough to the point where they kind of do care about how much AA there is, even in spite of their speed. So they perform much, much better when they're top tier when, as, when they're, as opposed to when they're bottom tier. Similarly for the torpedo bombers, the torpedo bombers are also pretty target agnostic, but do note that the alpha damage of 4,000 is fairly low. So versus lower tier ships with less overall HP, the individual torpedoes are going to be much more effective. And again, they're low HP aircraft, so even though they're high speed at 194 max, knots of maximum speed, they still are relatively affected. And as I mentioned, that alpha damage does shift somewhat in terms of the proportion of HP that you're dealing with and the amount of torpedo bulges present. Now, where the Augustus von Parsifal is most sensitive is its dive bombers. Now, it does have a three-plane dive bomber squadron with a lovely alpha of 7,800 per bomb. However, with AP bombers, as I mentioned when we went over the Shokaku and briefly when we went over the Enterprise, you do have to be aware of your penetration brackets. You need to know which ships you can penetrate and which ships you can't. And as you go toward higher tiers, you tend to get ships with more vertical protection, which can resist your AP bombers. So as a result, the Parsifal really, really, really doesn't like being bottom tier. It can survive when it's bottom tier, thanks to having decent regeneration times. Its regen times are not great at 82, 63, and 63, especially the torpedo bombers. If you lose them, you lose them. 
but they're nowhere near as bad as those of the British carriers. So it's not so much the regeneration times and speed that holds it back as in the case of the Implacable, as opposed to the picky nature of its munitions. It just doesn't have the same kind of versatility in terms of deal dealing with multiple ship tiers as the Shokaku. It is, however, better than the Implacable, so in terms of tiering sensitivity, I'm going to give the Augustus von Parsifal a B. In terms of endurance, the regeneration times are pretty good, and the reserves are not insubstantial, but not as substantial as the Lexington. You can see fully upgraded. We have 14, 14, and 14 aircraft. Also, I don't know why I put this module on instead of this module. So it's actually 16, 16, 16. So similar to the Lexington, but the torpedo bombers uh, do have that longer regeneration time at 88 seconds. Oh, actually, it's 72 seconds. It's not even that much longer, really. So it looks like fully upgraded. We have similar up times to the Lexington, which you tend to feel. It's, it's roughly the same, really. It's a pretty good expectation. But your planes are a fair bit squishier. They are faster. But they are squishy enough to the point where they're similar in durability overall to the Lexington. But because they're using armor-piercing munitions, they are quite a bit pickier. So in terms of your overall endurance, it puts you as roughly the same as the Lexington. So, pretty much A tier endurance. And as I mentioned, or mentioned briefly in that preamble, because of our AP munitions, we're even more picky than the Shokaku, because we have not only have AP rockets now, but our torpedoes also don't hit that hard, so even though they're very flexible, they're not a good alpha weapon, and then AP dive bombers are very picky, and they have worse accuracy than the Shokaku. So if we flip Flies over back. to this Parsifal video, you can see me attack a low-tier cruiser in this case. So my first pass is going to be against a uh, Indianapolis. And I get some nice citadels. But if I go after him again later in the match, you can see him maneuvering away. He's maneuvering and maneuvering, and I can't really get that broadside that I want, so I end up having to dump the rockets into a nice now. And because they're not meant to be dumped into a nice now, okay, they, they end up missing there, but let's say they did hit the nice now, they'd probably only hit for two to three thousand. So the munitions are not particularly flexible. The dive bombers, again, are also AP dive bombers, so they're not capable of damaging destroyers very well. And the torpedoes, while effective, don't hit for that hard. So in terms of overall flexibility, okay, you couldn't see any of that. Very nice. So I was showing off the... Sorry about that. So I was showing off the rockets at the beginning. So the rockets... AP rockets, if I can find a broadside, they're pretty effective. So I'm going to start off by using these rockets, as I mentioned, against this Indianapolis over here. And I do end up getting a relatively effective strike. The angles ever so slightly to avoid some of the damage, but I do manage to get them to be relatively effective, dealing 8,700 damage. Later on, I attack again. And I circle looking for that Indianapolis broadside, but he's actively maneuvering at this point and dodging, so I'm not able to find the right angle. And so I end up dumping the rockets into the water beside Anais now, trying to get onto the target. You can see they're a little more finicky, gliding over this mountain moves the reticle quite a bit, and I end up missing, but even if I hit that Anais now, they would only deal a couple thousand damage. And then likewise the dive bombers, while well, they can be extremely effective, as you will see them work here on this nice now, it's one of its ideal targets at this tier in this particular match. Versus a destroyer, they wouldn't really be able to do anything, and even versus the Indianapolis, I'm reluctant to use them because they actually might have a little too much penetration power, where they're not particularly effective. Dropping here with pretty much an ideal strike for a triple citadel. 
So in terms of flexibility, it's somewhat less flexible than the Shokaku, and I would probably rate it about the same as a Kaga in terms of needing to use the specialized squadrons for their intended targets. It might even be a little worse than that, and kind of similar to the Indomitable, really, where you need to use it in the right use cases. However, as, as we move into the last category of carrier power, you have to keep in mind how AP munitions work. So earlier I was railing about AP munitions and how they're picky, but I also railed on HE munitions and how they're healable. And the Parzival is mostly focused on AP munitions. So if you have AP rockets which hit for 2300 and you launch, uh, I believe the upgraded plane launches 18 of them? If I'm not mistaken, it should be. Oh no, it's 12. Okay, so the upgraded plane launches 12 of them. So you can chunk a cruiser for theoretically up to 23 by 12. 24,000 is the maximum alpha, and these are AP rockets, so if you sit it all, they will do that full 24,000. So that's obviously a large sum of unhealable damage. And the bombs, when fully upgraded, hit for 7,800 by 3 in a single pass, and that ends up being roughly 24,000. So again, that's a very large sum of damage, and again, it's AP damage that's unhealable. And so when you deal AP damage, and then you can supplement that AP damage with unhealable torpedo damage, which while being low damage is hard to avoid because the torpedoes are extremely fast in the tech tree carriers at 55 knots of base speed, you end up getting quite the ability to finish off targets. And if you're an effective carry at finishing off targets, you're going to have a lot of carry power. And so as a result, even though the Parsifal seems to be somewhat middling, it's not very flexible. It's very picky about using its right munitions. It has good endurance though. Uh, it ends up being able to carry a game pretty much just as hard as a Shokaku or Lexington or Kaga. The power of deleting someone off of a map is enough so that it's worth the games where you're bottom tier and you feel a little bit bad because when you're top tier the Parsifal is absolutely disgusting and you can carry even harder than even a Shokaku or Kaga because your AP munitions just become really unfair and the low HP of your planes is just largely mitigated. And so as a result, we're going to clean up the carry rating on the Augustus one Parsifal with NA. It is pretty much the same as these three top tier carriers that we started with. And that leaves us with the black sheep of the carrier family, the Graf Zeppelin, the German premium as our last entry. And so moving right along, the Graf Zeppelin. What have we here? So, the Graf Zeppelin is pretty unique in terms of carriers, so we're going to spend a little more time on the hull than usual, because the Graf Zeppelin is, well, it's, it's interesting. We'll start with the same formula. Look at the armor. Nothing particularly special, but do note that it again has a turtle back, which protects its citadel. The armor otherwise is thin, however, so it takes HP, HE and AP penetrations from most areas. If you look past the armor, 55,000 HP and 16% torpedo bulge, so pretty similar to the Shokaku, 10% inferior uh, torpedo protection, but similar HP. Now we are going to make a pit stop at its secondary armament, because the Graf Zeppelin has very unique secondaries. Now it's German, so its secondaries have one quarter HE pen. So these 105s have 26 millimeters of penetration, and these 150s have 38 millimeters of penetration. They have 9.4 kilometers of range, however, which is quite significant. And more importantly than the 9.4 kilometers of range, they're extremely accurate. They in fact have the best secondary accuracy in the game, so they are extremely potent for killing destroyers and even cruisers. And if you spec into IFHE to bring the penetration of the 105s, which make up the majority of the firepower on this deck, you can even pen battleship plating. It pushes the 105s up to 
I think it's 33 millimeters of penetration, which is just enough to pen battleship plate. And then, of course, these 105s, the 8 inch or sorry, 6 inch guns already penned 38 millimeters of penetration anyway. So the grass up and actually has fairly good self defense capability. In terms of AA, it's a little worse than the Barsville. 313 continuous and 6 lap puffs at 5.2 kilometers. But that's fine, it trades AA defense for surface capabilities. 33.6 knots and a 13 second rudder shift time, so much better rudder shift time and slightly faster than the Parsifal. And last but not least, concealment, it is horrible. Absolutely horrific. With the concealment expert skill and no concealment module, it sits at 14.1. I'm going to check my Parsifal detection again. So it jumped up from 11 from 10.6 to 11.8. This is the actual realistic concealment. Sorry, I got it wrong if you're still here for the ride earlier. So the realistic detection of the Parsifal is 11.8. And so sitting at 14.1 with the realistic 19 point caption build, uh, the Graf Sultan has absolutely horrific detection. So average armor, average AA, average maneuverability, very below average concealment and very above average secondaries ends up giving an average ish hall characteristic rating i'd give it maybe b plus a minus it's not quite as good as the overall actual i want to play an aircraft carrier hull of a lexington which got an a and it's not armored like the enterprise and implacable or sorry the implacable and indomitable which got an s but it is a fairly substantial hull with very potent secondaries so we're gonna earn it in a minus so how sensitive moving along how sensitive is the graph self and two differences in tier then uh and the answer is well it's pretty sensitive so it has the low hp high speed plane model of the augustus von parcival however unlike the parcival which has pretty normal regeneration times if you look here, we have 71 seconds on the rockets, 72 seconds on the torpedoes, and 83 seconds on the bombers. And this is below average. And so if you have below average regeneration, you better put out a pretty significant impact on the match. So let's look at the planes. The planes, the rocket planes deliver a 40 millimeter penetration rocket. That's pretty good. 40 millimeters is similar to the Lexington's 33 in that it ignores most of the tiering differences at the tier. The damage and fire chance is also good. However, the munitions density is kind of poor, delivering only four rockets per plane, so eight rockets per pass in that two by four setup. But overall, the rockets relatively tiering agnostic. Torpedoes, again, are tiering agnostic, and they deliver a slightly heavier warhead than the Parsifal, 5,300 as opposed to the 4,000 of the Parsifal. However, the torpedo is much, much slower. Even with torpedo acceleration, they only do 40 knots, which makes them unsuitable for dealing with destroyers. You can obviously still use them, and they're in a 3x3 setup, so it's not impossible to get a pretty good net to keep the destroyers from maneuvering, but they are difficult to use in that regard, so somewhat sensitive to tiering there. And then, last but not least, the dive bombers are... Actually, it's actually a fairly okay bomb. They hit for 5,800, and it's a 2x4 setup, so two bombs per pass, so only 10,000, 11,000-ish alpha per pass. They're on an extremely squishy aircraft that does an immense 227 knots of speed. <clears throat> However, the bombs are very inconsistent. They have enough penetration power to penetrate, say, a Montana, a Yamato, whatever, but they don't always do it. Sometimes they're going to ricochet sometimes even against targets that they are supposed to be able to penetrate, such as a Vladivostok or a Bismarck. They're going to hit the wrong part of the ship and they're going to ricochet. Against low-tier targets, such as cruisers, let's say you're attacking a Leander as opposed to a Baltimore or something, the bombs actually tend to have too much penetration and they tend to over-penetrate. And the reticle is not particularly consistent. While the Parsifal has a pretty normal reticle, that's similar but not identical to the 
uh, that of the Shokaku because of the diving position. The Graf Zeppelin has a kind of wonky dive bomber reticle. So there's a point where I use dive bombers on a cruiser. So this is a bottom tier game, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see that Graf Zeppelin has this circular reticle here on the screen. Speed, make that one pass, and then more than likely you're just going to F out. So as you can see me diving on, the reticle does not shrink. It stays in this circular shape, and it's a fairly large reticle as far as reticles go. Yes, it's circular and you can approach from any direction, but it's kind of imprecise. So you can see me attacking this Vladivostok here, and I get just a penetration. It just The bomb just happened to strike the wrong part of the ship. And uh, for, the Vladivostok doesn't have any AA, but versus heavier AA targets, uh, these planes are not particularly durable. So if you see me here in this sequence attacking this Riga, there's quite a bit more AA. I started with six planes here, and this time the bombs do have sufficient penetration to strike through and attack the Riga. So the bombs are not particularly there. And so depending on the tier that you're at, the Zeppelin can be more or less sensitive to tiering, but Overall, it's relatively insensitive because the bombs have enough punching power to hit both on-tier and up-tier targets. Same goes for the rockets. So, in terms of tiering sensitivity, the Zeppelin is actually relatively insensitive. Like, it might have sounded like I gave it a pretty scathing review in terms of how its munitions do, but in terms of producing the same results at every tier, the Graf Zeppelin is actually kind of consistent. The torpedoes pretty much always do what you want, the bombs pretty much always do what they do, and the rockets pretty much always spray all over the place, but sometimes when they hit, they'll deal some damage. It's just that all of the damage that the Graf Zeppelin can do overall in basically any tier is always kind of mediocre. And so, because of that, I am going to give the Graf Zeppelin, sorry about that in the background, a A rating for tiering sensitivity, it's relatively insensitive to tier, it's just that it's kind of mediocre at every tier. Now moving on to endurance, as I glossed over, the grass open has kind of below average deck space. Unlike the 16-16-16 setup of the Parsifal, the grass open only has a 14-16-14 setup. In addition, that 14-16-14 setup has longer regeneration times. So as a result, over the course of a match, as you spend planes, the Parsifal is going to have a kind of hard time keeping up. She doesn't have the slingshot capability of the Indomitable, and even though her planes are extremely fast, they remain so squishy to the point that you will have losses in spite of that speed. So for her overall endurance, I'm going to give her a B. It's not great, but it's not completely terrible, like that of the Saipan or the Implacable. In terms of flexibility, the Grouse Open is a little bit more flexible than her Tech Tree cousin. She has HE rockets that pen basically everything, she has torpedoes that deal a little more damage, and she has AB dive bombers that are a little less picky about tiering. Uh, the Augustus von Parsifal's AP dive bombers, for example, can't really pan a Musashi or Yamato that effectively. They can theoretically do it, but they don't consistently do it. The Grav Zeppelin can pretty much always pen a Musashi. It has enough penetration power to do it. It's just a matter of if the bombs hit the right spot. Now, having said that, the AP bombers and the HE rockets are not very consistent. They kind of spray all over the place. Um, if we go back to that clip, you saw that one nice hit on the um, on the Riga there. But here, if we move on to these rockets, you'll see that they're kind of slow. This is a very low a AA Kagaro here. So you see that reticle. Now I'm only launching eight rockets in this reticle. Now I'm going to get fairly lucky, but you can see I only hit two rockets here. So that's fairly unlucky, but I think we start with a better pass. So we're launching eight rockets, searching, 
So let's see how the beginning of the attack went. So these rockets can be used for pretty much anything, but they are one of the better anti-destroyer tools pre-dropping here. Considering attacking the Palmer at this point, I think, which is why I pre-dropped. But I end up finding the destroyer. So I'm maneuvering. You can see it's a pretty imperfect angle. Oh, but he's maneuvering, angling. I launch, and I do get a fairly nice four rocket hit, even though it's not lined up. Now this time I'm going to line it up. So I would say this line up here is quite a bit more ideal than the previous strike. But I only end up landing two rockets, even though the angle was better. And that's kind of just showing off the inconsistency of the uh, Zeppelin rockets. And so as a result, even though we have HE rockets and slightly more consistent dive bombers in some ways, and as well as a torpedo warhead which hits a little harder, the grass open isn't really any more flexible than the Parsifal at all. So again, I'm going to score it with a similar B- minus rating, pretty identical. Now that leaves carry power as our last parameter. And this is where the grass open gets interesting. So you have one real squadron, the torpedo bombers, and you have rockets that are sometimes applicable, but they're a bit slow at 180 knots of speed max. And you have dive bombers which are pretty inconsistent, so you can't always guarantee that they deliver their damage onto the target, and even if they do, it's only about 10,000. That's half the AP dive bomb alpha of the Parsifal. Your torpedoes hit for 25% more each, so 25% more overall if you can land them, because they're harder to land at only 40 knots compared to the Parsifal's 57. And then your rockets hit for a pretty good amount for an HE rocket, but it doesn't really compare to that crippling AP Citadel Alpha on the Parzival. And so, overall the aircraft on the Zeppelin are actually just worse in general for carrying a game than the Parzival. They're just not consistent enough. And so, the Grass Zeppelin's not a great carry ship you kind of really struggle to do your job as a carrier sometimes, especially if you take some random losses to your aircraft squadrons in the middle of a game. Now you do have these secondaries which, with which you can accomplish some very interesting things. The grass weapon when she's top tier or on tier can push into a cap and kind of bully cruisers and destroyers out of it because she can spot destroyers and cruisers with her planes and then just rip them to shreds with her secondaries. However, this is a very niche case. As much as people meme about playing Grass Open as a secondary carrier, and she can be specced quite effectively into secondaries, uh, a carrier needs to be played as a carrier. And as a carrier, the Grass Open sometimes feels like she only has one squadron, the Torpedo Bomber squadron. And so carrying a game as an aircraft carrier against an enemy carrier, where you only have one real squadron and two kind of sub-par squadrons can be extremely difficult. Playing one squadron against three is not something you really want to do. And so, even though I had all these nice things to say about the Graf Zeppelin with its relatively reliable torpedoes and its serviceable rockets when they hit, the fact that one of the tools that should be one of his key weapons, it's, it's a AP dive bomber, is so wildly inconsistent means that it's really hard to rely on the grass weapon to deal damage when you need to if you can't use torpedoes. And so that takes away a lot of its overall carry power. And so even though it seems like a nice package on paper based on the overall numbers, um, it's, it just the grass weapon just ends up being a carrier that can't be trusted to actually carry the game. And so I can't really give it much better rating than any other carrier. Like, even the Implacable, even though it's across the board, C, 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 it's at least a reliable C. 
And even though these no these letters are higher, and I'm saying that the grasshopper is better in this situation, it's better in this situation, it's better sometimes, not always. The implacable is mediocre, but at least it's always mediocre, and it's never useless. So, as a result, I fe really feel like sometimes games just happen to you in the rest of them where you really can't do anything even though it has all these nice things in its overall package so i can't really rate it very much higher than the implacable so as a result i'm gonna rate it as a c plus and so that kind of sums up our nine carriers at tier h as an overall overview and so you can see all these letters. So these are the parameters. And just as a reminder, these are the overall descriptions of our parameters that we use to judge them. So overall, we have a pretty diverse lineup. So these are the carriers by various metric. So where does that leave us overall? So as a TLDR, having gone over all the carriers at this point, you do have a bit of a tier list, general, a general tier list overall. So this is my general opinion of all the carriers. So you can see there's some pluses and minuses here. But at S tier, we have Enterprise, just overall the best carrier at the tier, thanks to its general characteristics of being a Shokaku plus. Below the ent Enterprise, we have the Shokaku and Lexington, the two original tier 8 tech tree carriers. Uh, this is rating them on both their flexibility and their ability to carry a game. General package of leaning on flexibility for Lexington versus the more focused AP damage of the Shokaku. Lexington better for less experienced players, Shokaku better for more experienced players. At A, we have the Augustus one Parsifal. Again, the Parsifal with AP munitions being better for more specialized experienced players, and the Kago with its immense plane reserves and AP damage being more for less experienced players it's more forgiving and that's sitting at a tier below just slightly below the shokaku and lexington after that at a significant downgrade beneath kaga and parsifal at b we have the super specialized saipan which front loads its damage and the indomitable which is ultra specialized for fire starting and then slightly below them at b minus we have the implacable which is mediocre but at least it's stably mediocre and then last but not least I have Graf Zeppelin at C because I want my aircraft carrier to be an aircraft carrier, not a whole platform of secondaries that has plane squadrons that are grossly unreliable. Now, some people might argue that the Graf Zeppelin is better than the Implacable. At, at times, I have had I have felt that it's better than the Implacable, which is reflected in its ratings here and its overall. If you break it down, its individual components seem to be much higher. The fact that it just can't be trusted to generally perform at that level all the time makes me give it the same C plus rating in terms of carry power as the Implacable. And because you have to purchase a Graf Zeppelin as opposed to the Implacable being accessible in the tech tree, uh, that further factors into me rating it overall at, as a C to your carrier. And as I say here in this little brief thing, I don't rate any carriers as D or F overall because a carrier is still a carrier overall. It has the utility of global spotting and being able to attack targets on demand. Uh, and yeah, that's that's it, pretty much. I really have nothing else to say at this point. I've been going on for God knows how long, so hopefully this is not too grating on you. But yeah, uh, sad. It would have been nice to provide some more live gameplay footage, but sadly it was would not have been uh, that easy for me to do overall. So I hope this overview of tier 8 carriers was helpful to you and kind of maybe helped inform you where you wanted to go if you're looking to play a carrier. Uh, with that said, I hope you enjoyed this tier 8 overview and I will catch you all later. Cheers.